is we used to run this thing called Mr. Good Bar. This is one of my favorite things in the world that I love. Uh, what would happen is the OTC class, you know, they do hand to hand every day. And then their final exam back in the day was Mr. Good Bar. And Mr. Good Bar is, is you walk in a bar, they give you like headgear and gloves. You're in the indoor shoot house, right? So you have no idea what's going to go on. I bring you in a bar with 30 guys in the bar. And I tell you right before you walk in, you gotta go to the bartender and you gotta say, I'm looking for Mr. Good Bar, mother. That's what starts it. 30 dudes from the squadrons, all, everyone's got gloves on, everyone's got headgear on. Like, you know what I mean? It's not like there's one guy with gloves and headgear where you're like, oh, I'm gonna have to fight that guy, right? Like, everybody's got that. Knob. They just jump his ass. Uh, you know, he gets up. Then you'll go to like a four on one room, a two on one room, and then a one on one room. That's where I always worked, right? I've never had a guy be able to make his way out of a small room with me, ever. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have a unique episode where I share my own combat story as SOB Tactical Founder and retired Delta Force Sergeant Major John Shrek McPhee interviews yours truly. Don't be fooled, however. Although John helps me tell my origin story growing up overseas, going on to be an Apache helicopter pilot and then CIA officer, we hear far more insights from John's career with the unit as well. In this episode, John and I talk about combat, losing friends, growing up, and swapping stories about our experiences as a pilot and Delta operator that many outside these professions have never heard, such as flying the bag and the Mr. Good Bar test. John even takes a moment to put on a sweater that used to belong to Saddam Hussein. I hope you enjoy this wide-ranging, real, and whiskey-filled interview as much as we did. I'm John Shrek McPhee, the Sheriff of Baghdad. This is the SOB Podcast. I'm here with Ryan from Combat Stories. Uh, I was on his episode number 25 and uh, I had a great time. It was fun. And I asked him if I could do his origin story because when you do your own podcast, you don't get to talk about yourself. You're always asking questions, figuring people out, you know, uh, as fun as it might be or as good as it is, it's still you never get to uh, talk about yourself, you know, even in your own podcast. So I appreciated uh, him having me on. We had a good time. And then uh, now is my time to question him for his origin story. So uh, what do you think about this? Man, I, I'll tell you, I'd rather be on the other side asking the questions. This, uh, <laughs> this is unnerving being on this side. It reminds me of the first time like firing a, a missile or something, the, the nerves that you have going into. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone around you is like, just push the damn button. What are you doing? Let's go, Let's right? Go. And you're like, I don't know about this. And everyone else, new guy, new guy. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, you've been doing the combat stories, right? Um, You've done 25 now. What yep. what what started you on that? I mean, like, let's just yeah. start there, and then I'll, I will kind of back up a little. Yeah, for sure. And wh while we're going along, John, just to take a oh. page out of your book, I'm drinking some uh, some whiskey today. Yes. As are you. Are you have some in your? Uh... Uh, there we go. What is it? Dead man's. So, yeah. So check this out. Yeah. So here's what I'm rocking today. I was uh, with the SWAT team in Michigan last week, and they gave me this. I think it's a Michigan, a Michigan, like, I don't know. What do you call it? Micro brewery for whiskey. Micro yeah. distillery? distillery? I don't know. Yeah. So they brought this to me the last day we went to dinner, right? So they brought this to me, and uh, it's actually really good. So I figured for you and uh, the combat stories, origin story, I would drink the Dead Man's Bounty out of a dead man's glass that we got a bounty on, huh? <laughs> Woo! Love it. And yeah, from the last episode when we were talking, I saw you drinking out of the little tea tea glass. And, yeah. and at the yeah. end, afterwards, I should have asked you on air. I was like, are you drinking tea? John John Shrek McPhee cannot be drinking tea. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 no. It's, uh, so I'm also and then drinking. look, you got to get the out. perfect pour. Look I'm at out. this. Oh, <laughs> perfect pour. Woo! Uh, John, I'm on the left coast, so I've got uh, Lost Republic single barrel straight bourbon whiskey. So this is uh, also a micro distillery out of California. Yeah. Starting with that, and when I start telling like more lies, I'm going to move to Scotch. Yes. 
Well, hey, just so you know, I keep this really good bottle, the McAllen Uncut. Have you ever had that? No. It's okay. good scotch. Uh, so I keep a bottle in my garage, right? I I try to take a bottle of booze to the garage and I just leave it in there. That way if I'm doing yard work or something, right? Like who doesn't have a bottle of booze? You know, my, my grandpa used to have moonshine in the garage, right? So maybe it's not normal, but it's normal to me and my family. So okay. uh, I was like, I was out in the garage. I was about to go, uh, you know, pollen's really bad here right now, right? Like everything gets coated yellow right now, right? So I'm leaf blowing and I like get done and my eyes are kind of scratchy. Like I don't have hay fever, but when I blow all the pollen with the leaf blower, like my face itches, my face red. So I was like, man, you know, it'd be good right now. Some nice scotch. So like I had some scotch just before I got here because I just finished my chores to come get totally normal. Yeah. Hey, hey John, the, yeah. the SAR major is trying to grow grass this year. When the SAR major gets grass, I'm out there raking lines in the dirt. I'm flipping rocks. I got the mower. Like I'm growing grass. You don't bring in some privates to help out on, uh, on the yard work. Uh, uh, all my privates are now privates in the army. That's like, right. so <laughs> Your uh, I had, gone. I had privates. Yeah. They're, they're all gone. <laughs> they're trained um, and on their own now. All right. So for me, John, uh, you know, we yeah. had talked offline, but I, I started this podcast combat story because I'd gotten out of the military and then I did eight years at CIA and I just missed talking to guys like you. I think, yeah. I think that each one of us has like a Hollywood film in us and like some people on a different level, like yours, that people can attest to, but every person I've talked to could have a Hollywood story written about them. It's just amazing Completely. what goes on in combat. I would also say this is any one day in Iraq, yeah. you remember the big stories, right? Like we came in and we freed the shit out of people who didn't give a fuck about us. Right. Like, and that's the big strategic and that's what people kind of remember. Right. But what you miss is any one day, you know, uh, we used to call it the billion dollar minutes. Like, you know, we're going after Zarqawi, yo, we're burning a billion a minute right now. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I would say this is those situations also not only cost a billion dollars a minute or making a billion memories a minute. You know what I mean? Thousands of tiny survival stories in a bigger story, you know? Yeah, what? So I have trouble remembering some of them now. Like I, last time I was deployed with the military was 2008. So it's been a while and it's just hard to, to come back with some of those like all the missions that you go on, but there are some yeah. that definitely stick with you to, to your yeah, point on like the, the little things that still come back for sure. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I find that, uh, like, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, you only talk to so many people, right? I talk to my wife most of the time, right? Like we talk all the time. Um, when you talk to someone else or you see someone you haven't seen, you know what I mean? That's what sparks, uh, a memory of, Oh shit. Yeah. yeah. Like, Oh yeah. Right. Uh, so, and I think that's everybody. So it's just a matter of honestly, like if you talk about it as movies is, you know, capturing that memory, that spark, you know, and then, but yeah, I honestly, like, you know, I do the membership thing and I have a lot of guys come to classes and I'll, a guy will ask me a question and I'll tell him something. And a dude will be like, I ain't never heard you say anything like that. You know what I mean? I've known you a long yeah. time. I never heard anything like that. Like, yeah. And and it's just like, well, you never asked me that question. You know what I mean? So I think with the memories, you know, like, man, I, you know, I used to just lay in my bunk in Iraq and think like, no shit, how many fucking survival stories are going on right now in this piece? And I'm not just talking Joe against Iraq. I'm talking Iraqi criminals robbing houses. You know how many houses we raided? We're like, you guys are Americans. Ooh, we're like pulling gold out of their butt crack. You know what I mean? Like, you know, someone <laughs> kicks in your door in the middle of the night, you're going to get raped and died. That happens every day in Iraq. So it's like, well, the Americans, ooh, yeah, we don't got shit, but we're happy it's you guys, right? So not just Joe stories, but uh, yeah. kids, wives, like, you know. Uh, I'm fucking crazy. It's crazy, right? For sure. And, and I got to say, like you were asking me about my origin story. I mean, I yeah, I grew up overseas, so I didn't come back to the states until like ninth grade. So I spent like my childhood in Southern Africa, um, okay. Pakistan, 
Europe, just moving all the time. I spent four years in Zimbabwe, four years in Pakistan. And I was in Pakistan during the Gulf War when I was like, I don't know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. So when you were jacking up your your leg on that jump that you were telling me about, which is a <laughs> yeah. crazy story, jumping in uh, for a desert storm. Um, I was, I was in Pakistan and our family got evacuated out. So I kind of had this experience with people in different cultures early, early on I left yeah. for the war, came back afterwards and people just hated us after, like being an American in a Muslim country hated us, but that. it was totally different experience from a lot of the other guys I ended up going to high school with when I came back to the U S and it felt more at home to what I experienced in the military and CIA later on, like the different cultures, the people you come across, the stories you have, the places you see. It's just yeah. a whole other world. Uh, you started out right in uh, South Africa. So why, why did you travel so much as a kid? Yeah. So my old man was in the real state department. So he was a diplomat. Um, I was younger in the, in the order with the, my siblings. So he was kind of at the tail end of his career as we were growing up. So he was more senior. He was the second second in charge of the embassy in Zimbabwe, which is um, the capital there is Harare. So I went to this British school where teachers could beat you. Like it kind of like probably how our parents grew up in school. The stories we mm-hmm. knew, that's what we were getting. Day yeah. Day. Very, hey, any of the embassy or DOD schools overseas are way higher standards, stricter than any schools in the States. Oh yeah. And they're good too. I mean, it's, so it's, it's, it's a good opportunity. You meet all these different people. And, and there it was kind of cool because you didn't play any U.S. sports. So I grew up playing rugby, squash. Yes, tennis. I love it. Rugby. Yeah. So like that's to this day, I just love watching rugby still. Hey, I follow every team, the Guinness Tour. Like I follow, really? you know, Instagram. I follow everything. What, rugby what got all you the into time. it? I played for Fort Bragg in the Army. No way. What? Yeah. Yeah. What? Let me uh, hold up. What did you play? Were you uh, a hooker, a prop, or no? no were you as a prop? Yeah. Prop. As yeah. the loose head, the left prop. Dang. And so then it's like, hey, they're like, where'd you learn the left prop like that? I was like, I never propped in my life. You know what I mean? Like, and they're like, you're so good at as a left prop. And it was like, I am left-handed. Maybe I'm supposed to be on this side. I don't know. It is funny watching Americans like when I when I was playing in the army in Germany, watching American guys who grew up playing football the first time they go and hit somebody like they got pads on and it's just oh. not the same, you know, like a, a shoulder's getting dislocated. There's technique to it that we just don't learn in football. None, none, man. And then look, I see all the time the football teams are like, you know, I come over to the, you know, whatever premier league and rugby and I'll play rugby. And, uh, you know, all the, all the rugby guys are like, come on, mate, come on. We'll show you what yeah. we do. Come on. You know, like For they sure. never tell it, they're never mean to them or anything. Cause it's just like, yeah, you're wearing pads. You got a helmet on, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I'm surprised rugby isn't a bigger game in the States. I know seeing that like UFC and stuff like that are so popular. Yeah. I think there's just not so, the money in it. I, I played a tournament when I was in Germany with the, with the army, a mm-hmm. Heineken tournament in Amsterdam. It was incredible. Like just all all the Heineken you can drink, teams from all over the world. Yes. I broke my nose. Like I was the first guy injured in the tournament. And the the doctor was like, Oh, nice. Congratulations. You're the first injury. Let me reset your nose. (laughs) Oh God. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, Love it. Okay. So back to South Africa, right? So uh you were just a little guy there. I was a little guy there, pretty for I don't know, like probably five to uh, eight or nine. And then, and that was a formative time for me. Like I'd never been in a place like that, obviously. And then we moved to Pakistan after that for four years, which was another Oof. huge culture shock. Yeah, um, for sure. You were in Islamabad. Yeah. So we were in Islamabad, but like, you've probably seen far more of Pakistan than I ever saw. <laughs> I'm guessing. Uh, I've been to every boarding border <laughs> crossing point from fucking Parichinar you name it, like around the Parrot's Peak, all the way down to Wana, like everyone from both sides. You've probably never been to Islamabad. You've been to everywhere else. I have been to Islamabad. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, yeah, um, yeah. Fuck, fuck Pakistan, man. The frontier provinces. The this shit doesn't even make sense to me. You know what I mean? Like, I think people in Waziristan are freer than people anywhere else on the planet. 
no, nobody bothers them. They do what they want. Yeah, even the army guys was like, hey, we're not going in there. Like, why? They don't want us there. Like, I kind of like that, but <laughs> I can't. we got to go. And did you ever go to Dara um, where they have kind of like a bazaar of weapons where you can, and you've probably seen all kinds of places in Pakistan where you can do this, but you can kind of go out yeah. and just get an Uzi, an AK. Yeah, it's crazy. Pirate. In Afghanistan, you're, you're like walking down the street. It's like donkey, you know, random dirty goose weapons market. Like, <laughs> right. Oh man. So, okay. So yeah. yeah Pakistan, man. So, how old were you? I would imagine like what year was this too? Yeah. So this was like 80, uh, so 89 to 93, like right in the middle of the the Gulf war, the Gulf war was right in the middle of that time. Right. right. And, and so I was like, I went to one of the nice schools where all the diplomats kids went all of the business, like the, the wealthy locals sent their kids. Kids always had bodyguards. It's kind of an interesting dynamic. And when we came back to Pakistan after after the fighting, after the Gulf War ended and tensions were a little bit rough, I was at this, I, I was at a school dance, old school, boys to men, school dance, you know, <laughs> boys dancing, to men. <laughs> chaperones, all that. And I was dancing with an American Egyptian girl who went on to fly F-16s like later on in life. And these, these bodyguards pulled me out back, put a gun to my head. And they're like, we're going to kill you next time you touch a Muslim woman. And so that happened to me twice. And we got pulled out of that place, but like the tensions there were high. And so that was my like 12 to 13 year old experience. That was a huge like shock factor to me. Yeah. 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 Like culture, they don't want you fucking around in there. No, not at all. Which, you know, so it was kind of interesting to see the Muslim culture. That was the first time I was around mosques, which you've been around for years, of course. The the call to prayer, you know, the five beliefs of Islam, all of that was new to me at the time and very interesting to see at a young age. In Pakistan, we'd ride our, our bikes from our house to the embassy compound, like a 20 or 30 minute bike ride as a 10, 11, 12 year old. Like we don't even let our kids go to the bus stop on their own today. You know, it's traffic a, around the embassy is horrible. I wouldn't want my kids on the streets at all. No, man. No. Right? Like, I don't even want you out there on a bike. If you go out there, be in a bus or a tank, right. but don't go on a bike or yeah. a fucking scooter. You know, before I got to like Afghanistan and Pakistan, I always wondered where the Honda 80s on the planet went. Well, I guess they when they die here, they ship them over there and someone revives it and they keep riding them. Like, you know what I mean? It's so crazy, man. I hit this guy. There was three dudes on a Honda 80 and I hit him in a Toyota truck and didn't even no. spin him out, man. That dude like put me off. Like did some fucking hands yesterday. I was like, these guys are good, man. Is that what you were driving as a taxi driver? Uh, well, it depends. Yeah. So most of my taxi stuff was in Baghdad. It's just easy. It's unnoticeable. But, uh, in Afghanistan, it was always like the white Toyota truck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, that was in Kandahar and I had my little white Toyota, just like everyone else. Got it. So, okay. So you come to the States and it's a culture shock, right? Why do you think it's a culture shock? What was the biggest thing you remember about it? You know, I think there's a little bit kind of how a lot of vets talk about what it's like coming out of the military. Like you've had this very unique experience that a lot of people can't understand. And, you know, you come from living overseas as a kid. And, and you're in a town where everybody grew up in that town. And I had never lived in the same place more than three or four years. So I think there's a little bit of that that was different, but for me, and a lot of the vets I've talked to say this as well, like as you move around yourself or your kids, sports is a huge equalizer, right? Like it allows you to get in with different groups and, and be accepted a lot faster. So, you know, I played football, I wrestled, um, track, all all that kind of stuff. And just got me in with people who probably would have taken me years had I not been part of that culture. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, there's something about, and I don't care what age this is seeing the world to know what we're doing here. Right. And, you know, I, I, there's times where I've been disappointed in here And there's times where I couldn't love here more, you know, Yep. either way you have to accept it all. But I think, you know, 
man, being a kid and seeing the world like that, like, you know, my parents are like, we're going to Indiana to the dunes. Like, yo, I just drove that route last week. It's like 30 minutes. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, I wish I would have, I didn't appreciate the, the concept of America till I had seen a lot of the world. John, what was the first place you saw? Like, where was the first place you traveled to out of the U S was it with the military? Yeah. When I joined the army. Yeah. Was it for the Gulf war? Uh, good question. Um, I think I might've went to like Panama or something, the jungle school, you know, Um, but like, that's it. That's it. Damn. Yeah. We, so I have uh, three older brothers and my old man traveled a ton. So he was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam before working for the state department. Yeah. And we often talk about how many countries we visited. So at some point in time, I'd like to hear your, like, I'd like to know your count because it's got to be sky high and a couple places that most other people have not been. Yeah. I bet I have a few that no one goes to. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So if I'm offline, we'll have to do that. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're in high school right you join sports um what was what was the thing you didn't like about being back in the states I th- oh man i i did like coming back i mean my whole life was a couple years overseas and then like maybe one month back in the us every couple years and so like i just loved coming back watching baseball I'm big yeah. I'm a Cubs fan. I meant to ask you, are you uh, your South side? Are you, you a white Sox fan? Of course I am. I'm a South Damn sider. It. Yeah. Oh man. But I've been to a few, like, yeah, I'm, I'm a traditionally I'm a Sox fan. Uh, I've been to a few Cubs games before and like, dude, that whole part of Chicago Wrigley field, like yeah, it's awesome. what an experience. However, I'm supposed to say this. So. Yeah. yeah. What? Like back in the day, I, I just, we had not no roots. So right. I just, for some reason, gravitated right. to the Cubs. I had family that lived like on the north side of Chicago. Um, so like we'd go back, we'd see Ryan Sandberg and Dawson and these guys back in yeah. the day. It's, yeah. it's been cool to stay with them. But uh, that was my experience of like, this is what America is. When I'd come back and visit family for vacations, and then we'd go back to this completely foreign place as a kid. So I, I loved coming back to the U.S. and having all of the the amenities, the culturally things were easier, but I did miss the travel. Like I could just feel it in me that I wanted to get back overseas. Even, you know, a lot of the guys that I've talked to as vets who, who ended up not going to college, as you've described, like there was a bit of me that like I ended up going to college, but even when I was there, I was antsy to get out and go do stuff and just be on my own a little bit more. But, you know, I I did. So I I did the, the college route instead but I just really wanted to get back overseas. It's not that I didn't like anything in the U S it was just right. different than what, than what I had grown up with in these weird countries for sure. So for instance, John, like this was good. One of the first, uh, girls I dated back in Florida, I came over to her house and her mom was like, Oh, you're white. I thought you were from Africa. I was like, <laughs> you know, is it just, <laughs> no, nope. I'm a white guy. I'm an American actually. So yeah. good news. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'd rather take that than be called Pakistani again. You know what I mean? <laughs> that didn't happen. Yeah. You'd be like, yeah, you can call me African all you want. You can say I'm a Pakistani. We fight. I don't. I mean, in <laughs> in high school, it was odd because like I came from these re- really regimented schools, and in public school in Florida, it's it's just a different yeah. story. So like, teacher would be talking, kids are playing cards in class. No, like I can't even imagine what it's like now with phones and and whatnot. Yeah, I'm surprised they learn any of them. No, for sure. Yeah. I don't know. Like one of the guys I went to school with was Channing Tatum, who's gone on to become an actor. He's Magic mm-hmm. Mike. So Yeah, I know he is. The 21 I, Jump Street. Yeah, man. That's a good movie. I think that's an underrated movie. They're both of them are They're good. good. I watch them. They're good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like so he was in class again. He went on to be a stripper and, and make it like good, good dude just completely different from what I had seen uh, growing up elsewhere. So that was kind yeah. of my, my acclimation to the uh, U.S. Ain't no stories like that happening in Pakistan. I'll no, tell man. you that right now. No. You know what I mean? Like, you're not telling them if they're happening. You ain't going to strip your way to being famous out of Pakistan <laughs> as a dude or a chick. That's, it ain't happening. That's another thing that's great about the U.S. though. So, 
Yeah, true. Well, yeah, I, I don't think people understand the, uh, the premise of the American dream. You know what I mean? Yeah. We all want to be Tom Cruise. I fucking get it. Right. However, like I live a pretty cushy life. I did a little drinking today, right? You know, I did a little drinking today, right? I'm not even going to tell you what time it is because I don't want any judgy fuckers judging my retirement day off, by the way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and, yeah. but, uh, you know, look, having said all that, um, I don't know if I'd want to be anywhere else. It, it, it's true. I mean, I, I'm probably going to have some, some mounting, um, psychiatry bills for my kids when they're older but there, there are days when they're complaining and I, I pull out my phone and I'm like let me show you a picture of a kid in North Africa this is what he's doing right now and I'll show it to yeah. him and they're yeah. like okay all right all right I'll do my work yeah. it's it's air conditioned in here and I have food so yeah I know right look we don't even got to suffer weather anymore man yeah. no, we ain't even got to do weather right like what that's a I don't even want to get off on this tangent, but this is the problem with social media. I think it's a huge, I think it's a huge propaganda tool, A, but B, I think it's the same as reality TV. There's nothing real about it, but we're, our expectations are to live up to what we see. So John, like, that's a question I have for you though, man, because you have several like 300,000 people following you on Instagram but it's who the fuck now who right? would have thought that but like it's all real though and i think that's what people like the comments on the show that we did the people yeah. just love the fact that you're just a real guy yeah I, you know i was talking to i was talking to another guy this morning that you should have as a guest he's a buddy of mine he was a he's a c squadron guy actually and uh he's a saddam guy too right great story by the way but anyway um He's a great dude. And I was talking, we were talking about that today on how, look, we come from places that there's not a lot you can disclose, but we also have so much experience and so much we could give or share to someone else. You know what I mean? Um, and, and most guys won't do it because you're supposed, they think they're going to give away something secret. And it's like, oh, Oh, well, let's see. You seen me on Instagram and I said I went to Iraq? Yeah. When I retired, they put that in my files. It's no longer a secret, right? Like there's this individual. So anyway, I think that a lot of guys won't talk because of that. And the truth is, it's like, yeah, I'm not giving away the crown jewels of the defo. No. Like, a matter of fact, when I was in a position to know what they were, I didn't want to know. Don't fucking tell me. Like, The less you know, it, the better, man. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right. Like, um, you know, when I was, uh, when I became a SAR major, I got the, the J a, the money SAR major procurement, stuff like that. I did a lot of money for you guys, hundreds of millions of dollars for you guys. By the way. And, uh, they had to read me in to every program they had. It was like, it was like two eight hour days. The lady would read, get out the binder out of a safe in a secret room, spinning fucking dials, man. And I had to sit there and finally about four hours into the first day, I was like, I was like, okay, ma'am, I don't want to be disrespectful. I know I'm new here. Right. And I know the command entrust me with all this stuff and the money. Like I was like, but I don't want to know this. What do I need to do to, if I have to give money or, or do anything for this program, right? Like the people who are running it are going to come to me and request the money. Yes or no. And the lady's like, well, that's normally like how it works. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to know. What do I need to do? I started cracking open like books. It'd be a book. I'd like crack it open and live as small as possible. Sign it, close it. Like, I don't even want to know what the book that was about. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and like, the, the fucking staff thought I was crazy, but like before I was a SAR major, I just came from killing people in Baghdad. And it's like, yo, I don't want any of that in my head. Don't no. even share with me. It's not that I don't want to know. I do, but I know anything in my head can be gotten out. Just so <laughs> don't fucking tell me. That's my position. Don't fucking tell me. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and so John, you brought out something else that I wanted to ask you about. I see, I see yeah. the, the placement there. I like it. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. you, you were talking about talking to your buddy, right? And you've mentioned this before. It sounds like you stay in touch pretty well with a few guys. 
I am not very good at that. Um, and, and I know oh, a lot of vets, I, I think, are probably more on my side than yours. Yeah. No, How, I am. I am what's not your story with that, keep, man? I am not good at keeping in touch with people. Uh, I am, uh, I'll run myself. And, and I think this is why I think I get a lot of bad press on the internet because a lot of guys are trying to hustle and do stuff with other people. And I just run my own race. Like I'm not, I'm not paying attention to anyone else. I just kind of do me and I stay in my lane and this is what I do. And, and, and I'm good with that and I'm happy with that. And right. And so guys think I'm like, unattainable or whatever. Right. But the truth is, is, well, they didn't call me and ask me for something. Cause if you would have, I'd have gave it to you. So, uh, but over the years, man, you know, I just had a guy that was on my team. I was a new guy. He came in behind me like six months later, he just died of cancer. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, uh, I just, a lot of guys have died of cancer lately that I am dialing that phone. I am dialing your phone number and I'm calling you intentionally and on purpose. And if you're not around, I'm like, I just called the bullshit. I'll do it again. And I try to talk to my family. I try to call everyone in my family. I try to call, you know, my buddies. So I have had, you know, you know how you schedule a work day, right? I got to, I'm going to have a meeting at about nine, you know, I got to prep for that meeting and you're going to schedule your day in. I look at talking to older guys like this, like schedule, like work. It's something you got to do, whether you like it or not. You know what I mean? And then I'm telling you because dude, I don't want to hurt recruiting for the unit, but Yo, a lot of guys are fucking dying of cancer, man. You know what I mean? Like, yo, and a lot of guys are getting, a, and they're getting the same fucking shit. You can't tell me. And I'm not a doctor, right? Like, so I have no science. This is just my opinion. But, uh, you know, for all the judgy motherfuckers out there these days, but whatever, right? Uh, I think, like, I think it's serious. And um, so intentionally lately, I've tried to be the better friend, the better dad, the better buddy, the better ranger buddy, the better green beret to other green beret. So, yeah. and I've taken it seriously like work and that's when it succeeded for me. Right. Because you get in the grind, fuck man, you'll forget, you know, you're in the grind by the end of the day. Like I just want to get, you know, yeah. when I'm on the range all day, 50 some year old guy out in the heat in Phoenix, like, Yo, I'll have a couple drinks with you, but like, I, yo, I ain't gonna be up past nine thirty tonight. You know that, out, right? I'm like, out. we're we're just, we're, I'm just gonna call it now. Like, you can call me any name in the book. I don't care. Like, it's just, it's just fact, right? Like, so, uh, yeah, uh, I take it seriously and I do it like it's religious, like work. And I got to be honest, I didn't tell any of my buddies I was doing it, and I called a couple guys that kind of had their number or something. I called them out of the blue. How'd they like, receive yo, it? Dude, it was awesome. Yeah. And now we stay in touch and now they text me and uh, you know what I mean? Like, so everyone receives it. Well, it's just, you know, like, I don't know on Instagram, they, with the, all the, you know, like Instagram yeah. dog chicks dance and I don't fucking get it. I don't know. I don't know why everyone wants to dance the same song. I just get that out of the way. But um, you know how they talk about the chicks, like sliding into your DMS, like, like it's like some secret. I think there's something to that. And there's been a couple guys where I just, I'm like, yo, I know we haven't talked in approximately 18 years. Uh, I had your number. I just called the bullshit, man. How are you? Yeah. Right. And uh, it's always been well received and I'm glad I did it. And the more I've done that, the more I've know about other guys, the more I've been able to reach out to other guys. So I, I'm glad you brought yeah. that up. It sounds like the catalyst for you was your friends who you saw dying, right? Like at, at this point in life for me right now. And I think a lot of people have this, like I, I was only in the, in the army eight years. I was only in CIA eight years to me. I feel like, uh, like I quit them and I left these guys to go back into combat. And so I'm not, I don't deserve time with them anymore. Like I, I forfeited that. And I know that's crazy. I would never hold it. It's not crazy. That's, ever. that's real talk, man. Yeah. Look, you get off the train at the depot, get out of the way. 
Cause, cause whatever, how great you were today, tomorrow, they don't fucking need you. Yep. Like, so I don't, I felt like that and I feel like I shouldn't be bothering those guys or I feel like, but the reality is, is like, fuck that. No, I'm, I'm making those calls. Yeah. All right. So I might need to do that myself now. And I'm telling say, you, I, I had to do it like, like keeping a calendar. Like make work, yourself like, do it. Yeah. 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 My, so my old man, uh, as I mentioned, he flew Hueys in Vietnam. Um, he yeah. has a reunion with the guy. He was there for one year in 60, 68 to 69. And he has a reunion with them every year. The guys Fuck, from that I year. I know, man. I know. World War II is the same way. Yo, you think there's going to be a fucking 75th anniversary of the liberation of Kandahar? You think there's going to be a Baghdad hundred three, you know, no, fuck. No, no one gives a fuck about us, man. You know what I mean? You know, the country didn't like it when it was going on. They didn't like you when it was happening. And, uh, you know, and there's not going to be a fucking parade for you when you're 95, you know, they're going to just wish you fucking shut your mouth and fade away. Like everyone else. Right? Like, oh, so I got to yeah. tell you, like one, I went to one of their reunions. It, it was when I was in flight school, I think. And I, I'm sorry if I already told you this, but. I went to their reunion. It was at Fort Rucker where we get trained to fly. It's all these pilots from Vietnam. And they're like, Ryan, come on over here. Let, 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 we'll tell you about some of the shit your dad did. And then they were like, hey, when you guys deploy now, what uh, what's it like? Where, Where's the bar? And I was like, there's yeah. no bar anymore. Yeah. And they're like, well, where do you get drinks after you fly? And I was like, you don't get drinks anymore. This, this shit doesn't happen unless you smoke. <laughs> like, you can't drink and fly. Are you crazy? Yeah. Like, what? how do you do it? It's like, I don't know. I think for us as veterans, <clears throat> I think uh, just because of the status of the world, where the world is right now, and that's on every level, um, I think us as veterans, um, we're the unfortunate truth. Right. And I don't think there's ever going to be a parade like these 95 year old guys that are at D-Day drinking it up with dudes like what a fucking way to go out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. You, well, a the fucking guy didn't have a choice. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's World War Two. You're of age. You're able body. Shut the fuck up. Right. Like you're in the army now, son. Like um, so, you know, we we took their fucking young lives from them. And. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we have these anniversaries, the 75th D-Day, I made all the jumps. Like my goal is to jump all the World War II drop zones and jump past them all. And if I do it long enough, my, I told the lady that schedules everything. I'm like, look, I'm going to get enough guys to sign up where I want my own plane and we'll do our own thing. And she's like, you get the bodies, you got the plane, you could be the jump master. So awesome. I need about 17 to 20. I'm up to 11. Um, so, you know, I want to get a bunch of guys. We used to, yeah, come on. Can I get you in? Can Look, I've only too. done five jumps, John. Am I allowed? Am I allowed in? So, yeah, here's what you would have to do. You, you'd have to go do a practice jump. You, well, first off, you got to prevent, present all your army documentation. And they're going to double check you through the schoolhouse. They're thorough on that. You, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yo, I got two rounds in my garage reserves, you name it, man. I'm fucking, I could be out of anything right fucking now. You know what I mean? Anyway. Uh, yeah, you can, you can jump too. Yes. Everybody. If you were former airborne, even if you're not airborne, you can go through, it's like a three day jump school. Really? Yeah. They do or, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't have to go through it, but they teach a jump school and like, there's like guys that come to my classes and that. Uh, they've gone to jump school so they could jump, do a D-Day jump. Now, COVID fucked us, right, last year. So hopefully, you know, that'll be over in the next decade or so, right? Because yeah. it's so dangerous, by the way. But uh, when it is over, yo, I'm jumping again. So if you want to come, dude, you're in. John, I'll put me up. on as number 12. I'm in. Dude. I'm in. Yeah, dude. I'm, I'm telling you, like, it's hard not to get emotional. It's hard to jump the same drop zone you know all the drop zones in world war ii were the river bottoms where all the big tall grass is because ain't no trees there nothing grows there right like it floods so nothing you know you don't build houses there right so they jump the river bottoms right like 
And I'm telling you that soft grass is fucking dude. It was amazing. It was amazing, man. And like I ain't never had jumps that good, you know, in Ranger battalion, I scared to fucking jump. It was crazy up in the plane every time, you know, like, so the D day thing, dude, um, look, I'm, I, uh, for last year I rented, as soon as we left the 75th anniversary, I rented a house in St. Mare, which is like where in the middle of, you know, where the party's at. And it's like a 10 room house. St. Mary Glaze with the dude, yeah. with the paratrooper. Yeah. Hanging from the Yeah. That's the center of all the yeah. parties. Like, I mean, it's, it's wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder people in the whole town. Like, uh, yeah. if you haven't look, if you haven't been to D day, um, I would suggest you go and it's, it's one of those things where it's hard not to get emotional because this is where, you know, world war two, we beat the Nazis. Yeah. Great. Right. But what you don't hear is, you know, the little towns where the SS had killed everybody, the priests, the nurses, children, you know, the, the one town we went to, they put everyone in the church. They locked the doors. They were putting wood around it to burn the whole town and everyone alive into this church. Right. And then they ask a 10 year old kid to go get firewood. And that's the only survivor. It, you and, know, Hey John, is that yeah. the town where they left the ruins where they are? Uh, yeah. 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 I've been there. It's crazy. Crazy. Right. So it's like, you hear those stories, man. You're like, Ooh, I mean, this is next level shit. You know, people don't understand. Like, look, man, I get it. We fight wars. I get it. Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. I get it. There's wars going on right now. I would say everything after that date and time, right? I believe we're in the longest peace this planet has ever seen post World War II, but it had to take those stories and that that fucking travesty of humanity for people to go, yo, I don't think we're ready to do that again. Now, I think everyone's forgot about that. And I think we're going to fucking repeat this cycle because people are generally stupid. So uh, I think that's going to happen too. Do you not think that, that, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, the math is fuzzy in my head that they're going to have the band of brothers for the shit that you did. I mean, you, you guys were doing 15 to 20 raids a night, right? Like, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. It's amazing, man. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like, no, I don't think there's going to be anything like that. And I'll tell you why, because all the stories and I, again, right. Internet world. Um, everything is, is that single serving packet of soy sauce. You open it. It's all going to leak out. You, okay, you ain't got no more. Right. And everything is instant. So, you know, like, oh, look, all the Navy SEALs TV shows and shit like that. You know, those guys have so uh, over fantastic themselves that a unit story would be boring. Why? Because we didn't have to do that much shooting because everything went right. You know what I mean? Like, does that make sense? Like, it's it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't be a great fucking story. You know what I mean? The you know, look. And I'll tell you, like, you know, talk, you know, we'll talk about, uh, you know, the dog got, what's his name? Um, Baghdadi. The dog got Baghdadi. Well, what you would see is a textbook raid, light gunfire, because we contained, we focused our attack point. We were in, it's hard to stop. Like, you know what I mean? It would be boring to watch. The only thing to see would have been the dog mauling some fucking dude. You know what I mean? Like, and I would watch a dog maul any dude at any time. Like it doesn't matter. You have to do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Like let the dog go. Like I got a minute here. Like, um, so, uh, I don't think there'd be anything to see. And I think this is why, look, I'm going to tell you right now, I know a ton of guys and I'm one of them that have never taken a wounded and never taken a casualty under their leadership. But what I'm going to show you is a thousand boring fucking nights to make that happen. But in those thousand boring nights, we had containment. We we did everything right. So the enemy knew there's no chance of fucking winning or surviving. So don't do it. And they give up. And that's, yeah, you know, that's the best way to do it. But that's not what we see on Instagram. 
And that's not what the yeah. movies are, right? I mean, no. the, the lone survivor, I don't even understand it. You know how many times I went, I went out in Afghanistan alone. I would have killed more than there was Taliban in that town to go home and sleep in my own bed on that same night. I can tell you that right now. You know what I mean? Like, so, uh, yeah, I don't think there will be those stories. And I don't think there'll ever be those stories because it would be the most boring story ever told. Right? It, no, it's true. I mean, I, I think that a lot. When I talk to guys like you and I'm putting the, the videos together and I'm doing the research, I'm like, God, I, I wish I got into that world. But then even the, the worlds that I lived in as a pilot and then in the agency, there's a whole lot of boredom that comes along with a totally. couple minutes of insanity. And then totally. it's back to boring again. Right, right. Right. I think we had probably less unboring times than most, but yeah, yeah, that's the cycle. Sure it's, hurry, it's hurry up and wait, man. It's hurry up and wait. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell me about your pilot time. Where's, tell me, uh, tell me about flight school. Oh, and uh, I want to do something real quick. Like I always, I'm, I'm old school. I take paper notes. So I'm going to write on a piece of paper. I want, I'm going to tell you to look away. I'm yeah. going to hold it up. If you reference anything that I hold up on the screen, right? And if you reference it in any way, I will take a drink. I got these out of the freezer. It's the little peanut butter whiskey stuff. I'll drink one of these while you talk about pilot stuff. I'll hold up the reference. So my my goal is to throw at it throw out as much pilot jargon as I can so that you're drinking. No. So I want you to tell me about flight school, right? Flying in combat. We're going to talk about your pilot career next, Yep. right? I'm going to hold up something. I'm going to write on a piece of paper here. So everyone at home can see it. I want you to look away so I know you okay. can't see it. And if you use any, any reference while you talk about pilot stuff and you see me do a drink, you'll know, you'll know what it is. And then when we get done, if you see me take a drink or two, I want you to try to figure out what uh, the reference is. All right. So uh, you're not that old school because I also take notes by hand. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to take my own notes here. Yeah. You're doing this. yeah. Hey, I have one employee and she knows I'm serious when like, she calls me. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Okay. Well, All right. All right. What'd you say? Right. <laughs> She's always like, Oh shit! You're taking notes today. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm taking. I still notes, hate right? taking notes on a computer. I just want to write it with a pen. I, I, yeah, it's even, yeah. I try to talk into the phone a lot. I hit the little microphone, but the problem is, is when you talk into the phone and then you go look at it as a note, like, you know, a spell check isn't your friend. So there's going to be some crazy words in there, and you're like, uh, we're going to eat grandma for dinner. Like, no, there's a comma. Like. It's time for dinner, grandma. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm not, I'm not a big fan. The, the pen and paper, like it keeps it simple for me. Right. Okay. So we're talking about pilot stuff. I want you to look up, look away. Right. So you, know, you can't see the screen. Okay. Okay. All right. This so good. Do you mind me, if I steal this little trick, John, for later? Hey, I'll explain it to you. All right. All right. All right. I've been wanting to do this all day long. Matter yeah. of fact, I experimented. And, and I might've already drank one, but I mean, but I want to, you know, like when I do something, like I do the crawl, walk, run, you know, so I know it works to work out the bugs. make sure that this thing works. Dude, yeah. Right. I'm a star major. You got to be thorough. You know what I mean? Pay attention to detail. All right. So John, as <laughs> yeah, I talk tell about, me about, yeah, yeah, we talk about flight school and flying. Like yeah. you probably yeah. knew a lot of guys from 160th, I imagine. Tons, tons. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Have you heard about what it's like learning to hover? What this little. So I know about, I know about the test and I don't do well at it. I don't even, right? know, I, I don't even know what the test is, but you're right. So this is, this is kind of comical. This is like an ego blow to everyone. And whether you're like a warrant, like we had a warrant who came in from the SEAL program you're a hot shot. You've been flying planes for a long time. Like learning to hover is a soul crushing experience. Everybody <laughs> can do it, but it takes five to eight hours on the controls to learn. So if you take a guy who's like a, a 30 year 
fixed wing pilot and put him on to hover, he's not going to be able to hover. No, right? no, I know those are different skills. So when you go out to the schoolhouse, they give you all like these classes before they ever let you touch any flight control. And it's like, here's what the weather's like. Here's what the controls do. Here's what an engine. Right. You're a drop of oil. I dropped you in here. Like this is the diagram behind me of an Apache. <laughs> I dropped you in here. Where yeah. do you end up? Like you learn all that shit. And then they take you out to the flight line and they let you fly like straight and level for the first time. So you got an IP next to you. You're flying along, you're cruising. Everybody's like, oh, this is awesome. We're going like 60 knots. And they transfer the controls. Nobody dies. You're on them. They take them back. And you're like, I can do this. This is great. It's not going to take me five hours to hover. And then the day that they start hovering, they bring all the students out. They're like, all right, guys, you got some, like in my day, some dude who flew in Vietnam. He's like, all right, guys, we're going out to hover today. Get ready. Nobody's coming out alive in this one. So you go out, there's this huge open flat area in Alabama and they've got like 40 helicopters out there and they're commercial helicopters. They're like, they're called bell jet Rangers. Yeah. You hop in them, you got an IP in one seat, the student in the other, the IP picks the helicopter up, the blades are spinning. They pick it up to a five foot hover and they hold it there. It's like perfectly still. If you're watching from the side, it's like 40 helicopters that are just perfectly still at a hover. At the same moment, every instructor pilot transfers the controls to the student. And then like everything's cool for two seconds. And you're like, I got this. And then like you start to drift slightly. So you pull in, like you move the cyclic a little bit to the left. You move the cyclic over. And because you do that, you drop in altitude. So you pull in collective to, to come back up and you shoot up like 15 feet in the air. And as you pull in collective, your yaw changes. So you got to pull on the pedals and you're fucking spinning. And then the, the instructor pilot who's done this for 20 years after like su successfully living through Vietnam is like, no, 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 I got the controls. They bring it back down. They put it on the ground and they're like, you suck. We're doing it again. And they come up to a five foot hover. And you do that for several days until you've had like five to eight hours on the controls. And everybody comes out of that just mentally smoked from the, the toll it takes on you. I thought you were going to say there's going to be a 40 helicopter piled up as soon as the. <laughs> no, they know. They know because they've done this for so long. It's like a huge open area. And it's just like 40 helicopters fucking flying all over the place. The IPs, the instructor pilots do not get paid enough to do this. If there's an IP <laughs> listening, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've done that. I can't believe I'm alive today. I think I'd rather be shot at. Yeah, you would. Okay, so. <laughs> You learn to hover. So you learn to hover. The One of the scariest things you do in a helicopter is an auto rotation. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Before? Yeah. So I interviewed this guy, Greg Coker, who was a 160th yeah. pilot. He flew yeah, Cobras, Apaches, yeah. you know, and then he flew yeah. Little Bird guns. As I mentioned to you last time, like that's the, yeah. the best thing you can do in our gun community. Yeah. And he, so he got shot out of the sky, had an auto in combat, in daylight that he brought to the ground and lived from, which is like, yep. can't be any better. I can't believe he didn't get a DF, uh, distinguished flying cross for it. Because the, the unit and those guys don't like to give away awards for. Is that right? Behavior. Oh, fuck. It's horrible. Dude, tell me, uh, I don't know. Can you say more about that? Or like, yeah, I, I just assume don't give out shit. sprinkled with hey, awards. You, you know what you got to do to win a fucking bronze star in regular special forces. You know what you got to do to get a bronze star in general? If you're in the conventional army, I know. But you do a combat rotation. Yes. In yeah, but not at and the, the unit. The unit holds those in high regard, so the army hands them out like candy, like throwing them out, man. And like, yo, you see a unit guy with five or six bronze stars, like, yo, this guy's been in five or six really bad fucking situations. You know what I mean, like. I know green berets when I went to seventh group, like a guy got a silver star cause he entered a room alone. Like what, what? Like, you know what I mean? It is like, I went out alone. You know what I mean? And snatched a guy alone in Afghanistan. The fucking lone survivor couldn't even go out with a whole team of motherfuckers and snatch some dudes. Right. And like, I didn't get fucking shit. So uh, yeah, it's uh yeah, you ain't going to get shit. Just do your job. Shut the fuck up. Got it. So, so Yeah. 
uh, I was I was like, how the, how the hell did you not get a DFC from that? Anyway, so an auto is a crazy experience. You cut the engines, right. you fly down to the earth, and the only thing that keeps you like stable is the air rushing up through the rotor that turns it. Stable. Right. And then right. in the last 15 to 20 feet, you pull in the collective and you kind of get this little cushion and you hit the, gar- the right. ground pretty hard. You hit that close to the ground air pocket. Yeah. And 160th, they'll train that for real, like to the ground. In the regular army, they often will, they'll bring it, they'll, they won't actually cut the engine. They'll just take the engine power down, then they'll bring it back in so you don't hit the ground that hard. Yeah. So doing that in combat would just, like, I never had to do that. I can't imagine what it's like. In flight school, my main instructor pilot, he often smelled of this. Like we come in to fly. Love this guy. Love this I, guy. Already. He was a good dude. He was a good dude. He was a black guy. There aren't many pilots who are black. Super good guy. He flew in Vietnam. And uh, to this day, I remember he was, and, and I use this all the work I've done since at the agency and today in, in terms of prioritization, he's like Ryan, sir. Cause I was second Lieutenant. This dude had flown right. in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, and I was like, all right. Um, hey, if we lose an engine, we're gonna land with this auto rotation. If we lose our transmission, which powers the engine, we're yeah. fucked. I remember him saying that we're fucked. So every time we did a pre-flight inspection before we flew, like you you go around the aircraft, you check everything out. Like to me, the transmission was huge. Like priority wise, if there's going to be something that screws up, it cannot be this thing because the engine will no longer turn. The blade will no longer turn and we will just fall out of the sky. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if you had somebody like that, John, when you went through training that just like left a mark on you, but this dude early on left a mark on me. Yeah. I've had several guys over the years, like you ever tried this? I'd be like, that's fucking genius. Like, why didn't you just tell me that? Like, I just want to see what you do first. You know what I mean? It's like, what? Over the years, I've had several guys, like just whether it was guys that worked for me, like, hey, boss, I don't think this is the best idea. Like, maybe you're right, right? Uh, all the time, guys kind of, it, it's weird how you, ha- you get those imprints and you don't know what they are. Yeah. So anyway, like that left that left a lasting impression on me early on in my, in my flight school time. I imagine it's similar in, in the community you came from, John, but like for us, you lose a lot of guys in training in aviation. It's just inherently dangerous. And I'm sure with the CQB work, the live fire work you guys do, you probably get a bunch of injuries. I would imagine. I'm going to tell you this injuries and loss happen every day, no matter what your level is. Yeah. And, And so, I mean, it's hard to talk about like for us, We went through our deployment when I was a company commander. We didn't lose anybody. I felt very, to this day, I feel very proud about that. Like everybody came home to see their kids. Since then, somebody's passed. But the reason I bring it up is before I deployed in my first unit, I went to Germany. We did a gunnery exercise. So once a year in the conventional side, you go out to the range and shoot. And a lot of guys in 160th would tell me, they're like, dude, Come to 160th, you shoot every day. It's awesome. Yeah, you do that every day. Like, there's no yeah. end to the ammo. And I'm like, God, that would yeah. be great. But for us, it was like this dedicated one month. You're away from the family. You're out shooting. And it was early in the war. So it was 2004, 2005. Um, we went into the war as Apache pilots, like going out the way we were trained for the Cold War, right? So like we'd, we'd fly so, out, come to a hover as a battalion of like, 18 to 24 helicopters pop up and shoot all these missiles and come back. And it doesn't work in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it should you know, probably didn't work to begin with. You know what I mean? Like, pro- yeah. We never had to right? test like, it. Right. We never right. had to test that thing. I know. Like, so the unit that I arrived at had just redeployed from, from Iraq. And in March 23rd, March 23rd, 2003 was this huge day. They went out as a battalion, this old school mentality. They went out, and as a battalion, a couple of them crashed on takeoff. They were too heavy. They had this brownout condition. They got over the target area. They were getting ready to shoot. Bad guys were under them, shooting them. They weren't moving. They were too heavy. And, and it was just a, a, a train wreck. It was a really bad opening for the Apache helicopter in this fight. So the unit came back and we had to 
relearn tactics basically. So we went into this gunnery exercise, I think it was 2005, where we're learning now, like we were in Vietnam, like we're lighter, we have a, a lighter weapons load and we're shooting on the run. So instead of carrying right. 16 missiles, you got like three or four and you got your rockets, you got like 300 rounds of 30 millimeter and you're moving while you shoot. And it sounds easy, I think, but you can't, you kind of come up into these steep dives in this very advanced aircraft and you just get fixated on targets. So right. during this gunnery exercise, we had, we had two guys that, that went into this jump that they bumped up like a thousand feet, they come in, they're shooting a target. They're both the pilot and the co-pilot are fixated on the target and they couldn't pull up in time and they just flew straight into the ground. So like that was the first time I think for me, and I would ask you the same question, John, like for me, this was the first time I realized like real, like I had flown the helicopter before it's tough, yeah. but this is like a real, these were good pilots too. And this happened. Yeah, like, man. When did that? When did you realize that? Oh, I was still a new guy, you know. And like one of our bosses, it was like, "We're gonna work, you know, all day, every day, sixteen hours, Monday through Thursday, so we could take half a Friday off." And you're like, "Are you fucking like?" So on the thursday night late night live fire so we could have friday fuck a half a day on friday because we're gonna get done cleaning our shit and leave at like two in the morning you know what i mean like and then i'm gonna wake up most of friday's already gone so thanks for half a day but uh uh on one of those thursday night live fires this guy uh well actually his name is guy um he got his head lopped off by a rotor blade on a little bird you know, and then um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Uh, I almost got chewed up by a tail rotor, um, and uh, I seen that it hit his head. I seen him drop, and I seen this like blood spurt, like this huge blood spurt go out. So I was yelling for a medic, and his boss, who was a Panama vet, uh, uh, if I mention his name, you know who he is. Uh, he got Kurt Muse out of his prison. One of those guys, and uh, so. Uh, He grabbed me and he's like, he's like, shut the fuck up. And I'm like, he needs a medic. And he looked over at him. He was like, I don't think a medic's going to help him. Shut the fuck up. I'm like, whoa. Okay. Okay. John, was this, was this at the unit? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. And he was right. Like a medic, like yelling a medic is only making the situation worse. Right. He was, he was a hundred percent right on every level. I just didn't know what to do. Like, Let's get him a medic. Yeah, how Let's many get times the medic you, over there? Yeah. How many times have you seen a guy have that happen? Like you don't know what to do. I couldn't even believe I watched it. Oh, fuck. You know what I mean? And then what, what really got me is I'm a new guy and he was a senior guy. If this can happen to him, what fucking chance do Dude, I got? Exactly, man. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That was my biggest thing. It was, and then I'll tell you, like, I didn't say shit. I went home, uh, try to get a good night's sleep, you know? And then, uh, the next morning I woke up and it was my, my, uh, my, for my first wife, uh, I don't even want to go there by the way. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, she was like, who died? And I'm like, what? I didn't say shit to her, nor was I gonna, you know what I mean? Cause I didn't like her anyway, but whatever. That's the side point. I don't even want to, I told you I already didn't want to talk about it. Like, thanks for not bringing it up, making me bring it up by the way. Right. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, um, she was like, who died? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you kept talking about someone dying in your sleep. And I was like, fuck, I did. Like, I didn't even know. She could just see it on you. Yeah. 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 And I don't think that lady was interested in me, paid attention to anything I did. You know what I mean? Like, which makes it even more of a miracle that she figured it out. Uh, <laughs> no, um, okay. So let's go on. So uh, you're, you're, you're doing light loads. I would tell you this is here's how I probably would have used you in Iraq. And I'm just throwing this out there from a ground guy perspective. I get you in a column of about 10, you know, more than about four or five. And I'd have you do single file and I'd have you spread out, right? So every minute to 30 seconds, we could be hitting this target with a new batch of rounds. You guys are in, 
do a few hits. You're out. I got another one coming in 30 seconds. When you guys Roger up, I want to know how many you got, and I'm going to stand back until you're all done. Or by the time the guy, the last guy's done, I could give the first one who should be 30 seconds out now doing a racetrack, right? The, you know, let's do a second run. That's how I'd use you guys, but I don't know nothing about Apaches. No. So we never went out with more than two. I, no, that's not true. N- never more than four Apaches at a time. But nobody ever said that to us, you know? So maybe somebody's listening here and they're like, shit, maybe I could use them like this. That's what I would have done because, look, most target size skirm, what most firefights in Iraq are a, what I would call a troop size target. Kind of maybe one or two buildings, maybe 10 or 12 bad guys, right? And that's the the bulk of it. There was times in Fallujah where you'd get the two, 300 people mass on a position, right? But I would have done the same tactic there, but I would have had you guys come in low and flat, low and fast. And as soon as you get to the point where you could almost shoot, break, break, pivot, and rake the target as you're breaking and break off. Next guy come in. Because if I could have got target every 30, if I could have got ammo or, and strafing runs every 30 seconds for three to seven minutes, right? Like, fuck, man. You know what I mean? And and anyway, so that's how it is. No, hey, so no, the thing is, like, nobody ever said that. And one of the courses, th- this is actually a good one. One of the courses I went to was... So when you're on the officer track, all right, you're refilling here. All right. Yeah. I seen you just did. So I was like, so on the officer track, you know, you go to your basic course, learn how to fly, you go to a unit. And then before you go into command, you go to the the career course for captains. Right. And so I, I intentionally fought to get to the infantry captain's career course. It was called the maneuver captain's career course. So it's like all the infantry officers, all the armor officers, and then a couple token guys who are sprinkled in who are all going to go be company commanders later. Because I just, like as an Apache pilot, when I'm in combat, I want to understand how you guys are moving on the ground. You know, like, why do you breach the way you do? Why do you go in this way? How do you try to secure a target? Because that's like, when we're overhead, that's what we're looking at on the ground. So I thought it was right. hugely valuable. The aviation course, I'm probably going to get a lot of hate from this. It's a lot of like ultimate Frisbee, like, learn a little bit more about aviation, but there's not a ton more to learn. Like we just didn't understand the ground scheme of maneuver. So that was hugely right. useful to me. But when I was there, there were a couple things that were really, that I just loved that happened. One was it was at Benning. So we would cruise around and there'd be guys from Ranger Battalion, like doing combatives at nine, 10, 11 in the morning. And one of my infantry officer buddies, I'd be like, what the hell are they doing? They're like, that's just what you do in the morning in the infantry. I was like, that is not what you do in aviation in the morning. In the morning, you're going out on a coffee run. You got to bring the coffee in. You're pre-flight and you're doing mission mission prep, you're briefing, and then you go out to the aircraft. Like nobody's doing combatives here. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. We no. got machine guns. Like we, and, and we're not going to let someone in that we don't know into the helicopter. So like, there's no oh. chance of us having to fight somebody. So why do it? Oh, it ain't happening. Yeah. So like, to me, that was eye opening. but there were guys that I was in class with, like, as we were learning this, the company level, how you move around that a year later when I was in Afghanistan, like these dudes were on the ground and we were in the air supporting them. So when they were getting ready to move on a target, I could understand how they were moving in why they were doing what they're doing, what weapon systems they had, what their fields of fire were. Like we had never been exposed to that as pilots before. So it was really useful personally to see that. Well, if you were, I mean, think about this. If, if guys cordon off a building, basically an L shaped ambush, right. And you know how they're going to set this ambush up. You could figure out the best way for you to come in to support it. Exactly. But if you don't know what's fucking going on down there, you have to figure it out to engage. And what you're trying to do is pre-figure it out. So I give a snapshot like, oh, yeah, the guys are set up a banal. Yeah, I'm going to come in from the West on this one and come around. And, you know, like, uh, look, the more pilots, you know, like, look, I did. I did a lot of calls for fire in Tora Bora because our Air Force guy needed sleep 
fact of fucking life. You can't just do it indefinitely for fucking ever. You know what I mean? That's like true. seriously, right? And then you guy starts getting tired, and I'm like, look, don't be fucking giving that guy our grid. I I even looked up to know our grid to know if he even said something close to our grid. I fucking I'd be smacking a radio out of his hands, back. like what the fuck? Like that's our grid. You don't give that shit, right? So uh, I've done a lot of calls for fire to where like look, I'd be like. I'd have a plane like a beef deal. You know, it's like I got three B fifty twos calling me. I got some F sixteens. I got some planes I don't even know about. And I'd be like, I kick them. And I'm like, I mean, like, yo, man, these these looking guys are. What do I tell them? Uh, tell them to deconflict their airspace with the lead plane. And I'm like, like, yo, that's all I gotta say. I'm like, okay. So I'd be like. Yo, uh, D can fix your airspace with the uh, Ghost Rider. And they're like, Roger, 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 Roger. And then, like, it was amazing. So, but, but think about this is if you knew what guys were doing ahead of time, you'd know maybe the better way to come in, what would best support them. How, if you had to come in and do a hover to support, where would you want to hover? Right. Like, so I would think the more you could know about the look, uh, I'll tell you this. And, and I'm going to piss off all the fucking pilots out there. Aviation will always, always, always be the weak point of special operations. Like it or not, fucking say anything. Greg's the nicest guy ever. I love him to death, but I'm just fucking throwing it out there. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the ground situation changes. Most of those guys don't have enough ground experience to understand the guys on the ground, what decisions they're going to make and how to best support exactly what you're talking about right now. What we did is we kicked the task force out of our house in Baghdad and we refused to use them for like three or four months. For, and we did. When you say task force, you mean 160th, right, John? Yeah. Fucking yeah. completely kicked them out. We're not flying another fucking mission. Get out Holy of the house. Shit. Yeah. They got, they got what to the point use? where it was, it was army shit. Like, you know, we get a Saddam sighting and it takes, you know, 45 minutes for them to plan and then 30 minutes for pre-checks. And then it takes 45 minutes to warm up the plane. And it's like, yo, uh, we just got a Saddam sighting. We can't go three hours from now. You realize that, right? So the commanders kicked them out. Get away from us. We don't want anything to do with you guys. Fuck you guys. And then uh, the LNO that like lived with us that was in our squadron, right? Like, I know that guy was like, he just sat at his desk for months and so shit. <laughs> and he was a great guy and I felt so bad for him. But uh, we drove everywhere. And then finally, when the pilots moved in with us, right? Like, I mean, I got an air medal for flying fucking uh, little bird missions. Shut, wait, wait, time out. John, you have an yeah. air medal? Yeah, I got an air medal. You don't? I mean, I do, but I was a pilot. I didn't even know I could have one. Shit. Yeah, I think it's for like doing like 37 vehicle interdictions or something like that. I don't remember the number. I'd have to look at it. I could show That's it cool. to you one day. Yeah, I didn't even know I could get an air medal. But I like, so what happened is they moved the pilots in with us, right? And uh, who who was my pilot then? That guy, Rooster. You ever heard of a guy named Rooster? Kind of dog. You, red- you may have mentioned him before. Was Rooster anyway, the guy that PT'd your ass off? No, he's he was my little bird pilot. But anyway, okay. when we brought the pilots back in our house, he lived with my sniper team. He lived with us. Like we were at the pool in the morning. You know what I mean? He was in the gym. I was in the gym in planning. Like, yo, you're sit- I ride on your plane. You're sitting next to me in planning. Like, and when that happened, dude, we could be somewhere over Baghdad in 13 minutes. Because you just lived closer together, like they. Well, no, we stripped them away of all the bullshit aviation rules they got to live under. Wow, right? Because you're supporting me. If I go in, yeah. you're coming to pick me up, right? Just that premise alone made all the task force pilots, I think, more successful. Maybe they'll disagree, um, but I'm just telling you from my perspective, we got a better product from them when we made them live with us and they understood us yeah, on a personal level, like me to you, not institutionally. We work together as organizations like, yo, shut up. Like, do you know me or not? Come get me. I'm on this rooftop. Like, 
you can land here. How do I know we've landed worse places? Right. Like Re- remember back in so-and-so. Yeah. You landed up there. You could do that yeah, here. Like, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Right. It, and even if you were to say that on a radio, like, Hey, this is the same landing as, you know, it's a lip landing. Like we did in fucking wherever last month. And yeah, you yeah, could yeah. be like, Oh yeah, I remember that. I, I got all that. right. Right. Like to where without that, you got to figure that out. Yeah. And how do you, you know, yo, you're doing this stuff, right? Fuck. Wait, this, you know what I mean? Like Pretty much got it. Yeah. You know, I'm close. I'm close. I'm not good I'm enough close. to pass the test, but I'm close. Um, you're doing that and trying to deal with me being on the move as well or whatever. Like it, it's too, it's too much for someone to keep up with. But if you had the common knowledge ahead of time and you got the kind of what we're going to do out of the way, because you sat next to me when we planned this, you'd know where to come back to. Yeah, you'd know for sure. the best way to support already. Uh, I would, I would also say this is I would think there was a time in aviation's history, the Sante raid crash the fucking things. We have more who gives a fuck. You tell a pilot, we tried to plan missions where we're going to fucking crash and burn the planes. Not one fucking time did that go over well with the command. And it was like, it's just how we fucking got here. Like, uh, and but the thing is, is they cost a lot of money. They do. They do. Right. Yeah. But the reality is, is if crashing this and burning this was going to get everyone to survive right now, get rid of that motherfucker. Right. So, like, so John, I interviewed the youngest green beret on the Sante raid. It's this book right here. Uh, Who will go Terry Buckler. It's badass. The planning and execution yeah. that went into that raid, like, yeah. they didn't have the intended outcome, but it is, like, look, I didn't know about it in the past. I felt horrible that I didn't know, but I read that book. It's amazing yeah. what they did, and they did. They crash landed an aircraft on target for yeah. that raid, yeah, and that was the plan, Fuck. right? But I mean, telling, imagine telling a fucking pilot, "Hey, the plan is you to crash it in the middle of the target." That ain't fucking happening. That now, that's shocking on my book. Like, like you imagine telling the bad guys something like. Yo, they crashed 37 helicopters to come in and fuck us up last night. These dudes don't give a fuck about shit. Oh, they're going to get your money. Obviously, money's not the issue to these motherfuckers. No. Stay away. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is some yeah. stalker shit right here. Get the fuck out. Like, it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do, we, we did stuff with big army guys, pilots, tanks, and all the time it was, how do we best integrate? It's you huge. know what I mean? And huge. once that was figured out, this machine goes flawlessly. You know, one of my jobs as the money star major is I would make sure like, you know, we would bring in a brigade, right? A brigade is like pretty much a regiment. Um, we would have the Rangers under us and we'd bring in a brigade from the 10th mountain from the 82nd. And, you know, we'd have at our disposal, like 5,000 paratroopers for cordon. You know what I mean? Like, and so anyone we worked with was always so shocked at our flexibility. Well, what do you do best? Well, no, if you can do that, I need you here. Right. Like, uh, and, and then the best plans and the biggest fucking operations that we did, you know, we got a brigade of 10th mountain. We got, you know, we got their aviation assets, their support. We got Rangers. We got us. We got, you know, just to do what we needed to do when we'd have these big rock drills, you know, uh, I think someone said it once and, and don't, this isn't my quote, but you know um, I think someone in the unit, I think it was above the water fountain in the squadron bay room, you know, water fountain, you push the button and it was like a little bit of water and you're like old school. <laughs> you, you couldn't even get your lips on it. Cause they're like, it wasn't a lot coming out. You're like, anyway, um, I think over it, it said, you know, here in the Delta force, we are like flexible to the point of ignorance. But I also think having that flexibility makes you a formidable enemy. John, Hey, let's, let's uh, spend a minute. I mean, this is your calls, but, but I think we should spend a minute on that. Cause. Okay. Come on. I, I'm thinking back to my time in the military, right? So, right. And, and then I'm juxtaposing it with my time in the CIA. CIA was all about flexibility. Military, totally. the conventional side, the pilots, 
had the flex, but they had it when they were out on missions, you know, like aviation is the majority are warrant officers. And I don't know how, how many warrants you had in the, in, in the unit. And I know they have them in, in group, but within the unit, I don't know if it's a big population, but like you they, are an, an operator, you're an officer or a commander. And then the only warrants are support. Okay. Yeah. Like in aviation, they're the backbone of, mm-hmm. of flying. Like the best pilots are, are warrants for sure. When you're out on a mission, they have, they, they have the flexibility aspect. When we're in garrison, it's just big army. Like everybody who's listening to this knows big army and the pain points that come with it. The difference when I went to the agency was very much like everybody, I, I don't know how they self-select, not self-select, how they kind of triage the candidate pool, but the flexibility aspect is immense, probably like the unit, I would say. I'm not trying to to compare the so, agency to the unit, but no, that is a, we, how you deal with ambiguity is incredibly important at the agency. So uh, unit selection, you've probably heard this from other guys, unit selection starts out really regimented. You call me sergeant. You will be here at seven o'clock. You bring these things, right? You're at this point. You're going to this point. Do you have any questions? Uh, Roger that, sergeant. You know what I mean? And then, and then by the, you know, as selection gets going, they just write fucking, you know, zero six hundred on the board, move out. That's it. Like, and no one tells you shit. And the fucking big army guys freak the fuck out because they don't got someone fucking stroking the fire of what needs to do. And it's like, and then like, I love that shit. I'm like, yo, seven o'clock tomorrow. Peace out. Eight out. Mm-mm, I'll be in my bunk. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, like, and then, you know, like when I was in selection, I went with another guy who he made it later, but he didn't make it that time. <laughs> and uh, me and him would eat as much as possible every night and then go get on the scale. You're supposed to weigh your backpacks with to see how much in pounds of food we could eat. So we'd like weigh ourselves before we go. <laughs> we weigh ourselves when we come back. Right. Um, but uh, the unit very much the training always starts out regimented where everyone can understand it. And then it gets, uh, into the point where like, I told you where to be, what more do you need? Yeah. Right. And, and I think, I think that's huge in the culture. At the agency, it's like the, the hard work that goes on is on your own, right? Running a surveillance detection route, meeting with an asset, all of that is on your own. So right. how do you operate by yourself? How do you make difficult decisions when you don't have enough information, which right. you know, in the military, in conventional army, you're going to wait to get the, I mean, people will probably contradict me here, but for, for the most uh, part, you're bullshit, wait to bullshit. We did hits to gain Intel, which used to drive me crazy. Like we don't have any Intel. So hit these guys. Like what, what, we're doing raids. Like, anyway, it fucking happens. Hey, so I, I want to throw this out there. I, I, yeah. I want to tell a story about aviation that I think few people hear. And I, I would throw it back to you. Like if there's something okay. similar from your experience that not many people yeah. know about the, maybe the unit selection process or whatever it is. Have you heard about flying the bag? Flying the bag? Probably not. I know a lot of pilots. I know the test. I know the test they would have gave you if you wanted to come see us, right? Um, so I know a lot of that stuff. So I might have heard this before. So Th- this is only for Apaches. So okay, it's it's a bit of a lighthearted story. So I just want to share it because people. Yeah, who, let's hear it. I want to hear this. Been on the guys who've been on the ground and seen Apaches up high, like at night. This is kind of what's going on in the cockpit. But it starts with this. It's kind of like hovering, but it's so in hovering, everybody is with the same aircraft, except for the super tall guys. They get to fly in Hueys. Everybody else is in like this cramped up commercial here, helicopter. At the end of flight school, you select like based on where you finished up in flight school, you get to pick your aircraft, right? So they bring all 30 officers in and then separately, they bring in all the, wa- the warrant officers and they say, hey, right now the army's got three Apaches, 
four Kiowas, 18 Blackhawks, 15 Chinooks. Order of merit list. Number one, what do you want? And then you say like, hey, I want this aircraft and they cross it off the list, right? And then you go to, to learn how to fly your advanced aircraft. It's different for Chinooks, how you fly Blackhawks, Kiowas, and Apaches. So when you go to the Apache course, you have to fly the bag is what they call it. And I don't think many people hear about this. In an Apache, you can fly like in the daytime, just like both your eyes. At night, you've got night vision goggles. And and John, I'm sure for you, you probably had like maybe four. I, I don't even know what they're called, but like you have peripheral vision at in the. Oh unit. no, man! Hey, my no. day was Anvis only. Okay, so we had Anvis as well, but like you have the the binocular vision with Anvis, right? In the Apache, it's got this thing on the front, like right over here. It's called the FLIR, the Forward Looking Infrared, right? So it, it can detect changes in temperature. All of that is seen through one, we call it a monocle, like a little glass piece that's put up only in one eye. So you don't have binocular vision anymore. You can't tell depth perception. The, the relative motion of shit around you is off. And they have to teach you how to fly only looking out of like a little glass piece in one eye. The other eye is looking at all the stuff in the real world. Your eye that's in the glass monocle is looking at infrared. So they call it the bag because they put this bag over the cockpit area. Like, I don't know, I gotta go this way. Like this area right here yeah. has a shroud over it as you okay. learn to fly. Almost everybody pukes when doing this because it's you, you have to teach yourself how to fly with one eye so when you're coming in to land at, at a fast rate of speed, you got to slow up, but it, normal times you can look around, you got peripheral vision. You can tell like the difference in timing. You can't do that at all with this. So it's all using this weird, like two colors, like black and white, what's hot and what's not and how you come into land. And I would kick it over to you, John, like what comes to mind for what people don't realize that's so hard about some of the that you did? Oh, man. It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say this is kind of everything we do, there's a bag test, right? And and it, it may not make you throw up, but at the same time, like, as you go through OTC, right, you're going to do marksmanship, long range stuff, right? Like one to 300 yards with your army rifle, right? And then, then they're just giving you the marksmanship skills to be better, right? But at the end is a test, right? And I think everything we do, there was a bag test, but um, really uh, the, the kind of best bag test I've ever seen is we used to run this thing called Mr. Goodbar. You ever heard of this? No, no. It sounds like a great name. Yeah, Mr. Goodbar. This is one of my favorite things in the world that I loved. I was still a new to mid-level guy. I fought every day. I was in the dojo every day from fucking 1030 to one. I was boxing, wrestling, Muay Thai, you name it. Like uh, we did it. So uh, what would happen is the OTC class, you know, they do hand to hand every day. And then their final exam back in the day was Mr. Goodbar. And Mr. Goodbar is, is you walk in a bar, they give you like headgear and gloves. You're in the indoor shoot house, right? And then um, you're in the indoor shoot house. You go in uh, to the bar of the indoor shoot house. And it's just, it's all plywood. There's nothing fancy, right? Like nothing for training in the unit is fancy because we're going to fuck it up. So like it's the cheap shit, plywood and shit, right? Like when I was in special forces, like, hey, we need green beret, green carpet here. Like uh, when I was in the unit, fucking McChrystal slept on an army cot like everyone else. Like what the fuck is going on here? Right? Like I don't get it, but whatever. Uh, so we used to do Mr. Goodbar. Starts out, I give you gloves, headgear. I walk you into the shoot house. You have no idea what's going to go on. I bring you in a bar with fucking 30 guys in the bar. And I tell you right before you walk in, right? Got to go to the bartender and you got to say, I'm looking for Mr. Good bar motherfucker. That's what starts it. And a dude, like a dude will walk in there and then he walks into a bar and it'd be like 30 dudes from the squadrons. All everyone's got gloves on. Everyone's got headgear on. Like, you know what I mean? It's not like there's one guy with gloves and headgear where you're like, Oh, I'm gonna have to fight that guy. Right? Like everybody's got that shit on. 
because the unit can afford to buy that many sets. But you walk in there and like, you know, the guys would go to the bar and they're like, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking for Mr. Good bar. Right. And like the bartender would be like a guy who knows the deal and he'd be like, Mr. Good bar who, you know what I mean? Mr. Good bar. Um, well, I'm looking for Mr. Good bar, Mr. Good bar who, right? Like, when the bona fides is, you got to say the bona fides. And like, I like stutter, like, oh, I'm looking for Mr. Goodbar, motherfucker, right? <laughs> and then, like, they just jump his ass. Uh, you know, he gets fucked up. Like, everybody in the it, bar just swarms you. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah. You're going to get fucked up. But the truth is, is if you do what has been taught to you, people won't fight you and you'll walk out because you're doing the right things. If you do the wrong things and you try to fight everybody, you know, they're just going to fuck you up until you figure out, stop fucking doing this and do something else. And once you do something else, then you'll fucking get your way out. Right. So um, it's about doing what is right. Right. And then you'll go to like a four on one room, a two on one room, and then a one on one room. That's where I always worked. Right. I've never had a guy be able to make his way out of a small room with me ever. So, so John, if you can, if you can say like, what was it that got you out of the room? Okay. And if you can't, that's no problem. Yeah. Like, no, look, did you, um, did you get out of the room without having to fight 30 dudes? Oh yeah. Fuck. Yeah. I'm getting the fuck out. You got out. Oh fuck. Yeah. I'll get out. Motherfucker. You think you're going to lay some licks on me, bitch? I'm out. I'm out. Motherfuckers. <laughs> you know what I mean? You think the flash is going to take a fucking punch to the jaw? Hell no. He's too fucking fast. You know what I mean? But you're Shrek. So, I thought you're Shrek, like the, 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 retard. Oh yeah. Oh, I am. And I'll knock you the fuck out, but I'm going to tell you this. There's a time you where you can't beat everybody, right? You can't beat everybody. Shit. Right. You just can't, you can't beat everybody. So there's a time where you need to know discretion is the better part of valor and get the fuck out of there. And if a guy does that, right, he'll make it out. But if you're not trying to get out of there, if you get mad and you get sucked into these one-on-one -on -one fights, there's going to be a guy in the crowd like me that'll just put you down. What? And then when you come, when you come to, you're going to wake up in a bad situation because you're still here, motherfucker. Like it's not like you're <laughs> teleported somewhere safe. say. What, what was it you did to people in the one-on-one -on -one situation that they couldn't defeat? Like so, you putting them in the guillotine? Like what did you do? Oh, I'm a puncher, man. Now, fuck that. I'm not going to do jiu-jitsu. Too much energy. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. I'm going to pin you against the wall, and I'm going to keep fucking putting hooks and fucking into your body and jaw until you just fucking drop. This is the White Sox side of you, John. Yeah, yeah, shit. totally. Totally. The Cubs don't do shit like this. You know what I mean? The Cubs, Cubs would be are like, going Why? down, man. The Cubs yeah. are going down. The Cubs already left to go to the bar. You know what I mean? Like, you guys are going to do what? Like, this is stupid. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we used to do a Mr. Good Bar. And what it taught you was when you do the right things, the things will go your way. You'll be able to do what you need to do. But you got to break the ego side of it to understand that. Right. Cause a guy like me, I, I shouldn't say that. Cause I'm, I think I'm untypical. Maybe I am typical, but uh, an average guy will walk in there like, yo, I'm, I'm going to fuck up as many guys, these guys as possible. And then you got 30 fucking already in a squadron Delta force guys. And you think you're going to fuck them up. You're stupid. You know, it's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Four of them. You're still stupid. Two of them maybe one of them well it never happened that a student beat and a fucking instructor so that never happened either right but the truth is is like you can't engage and 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 i think my point is is this is one of the big uh black bag things that i learned like there's there's situations you can't win fucking walk away yeah you know what i mean and i think this was a black bag moment for me anyway and then we used to take videos and then the commander told me to my face, if this video ever gets on the internet, they're going to shut the Delta force down forever. No more Mr. Goodbar. And I'm like, well, I thought this was great. We taught so many dudes so much shit. We all got better. Like, <clears throat> yeah. So that, that does not go on in the conventional aviation units. I'm pretty sure it does not happen in one sixtieth either. Yeah. I don't think that happens anywhere these days.
Oh man. People are too worried about who's transgender, who's not. No. So in my day, we didn't care. Bring it to the mat. Leave it in the dojo. Yeah, Let's would, do this. John, like, would it matter if they were transgender or, no. or no homosexual? Gave a fuck. If they beat your ass down? If probably... Fuck no, dude. If this dude, like, yo, if I'm not even going to say dude, like, because there's pronoun issues that I don't even understand right now, but you know what I'm talking about? I don't want to offend anyone with this. But what I, I would say is, yo, you kicked my ass. Like, yo, we're friends right now. Like, what yeah. did you just do? How did you do that? Like, I've been doing this a long time. So none of that would even matter to me. Shit. God. Hey, and this is one of the things I like about the unit is the unit is based off of performance. Yeah. Yeah. If you perform, I don't care if you got three dicks, no dicks, 10 titties, no titties. I don't fucking care. Like. Yo, if you perform, I want to be with you on a mission. Man, I cannot second that even anymore. Like when I was at, at this, this is a good story. Um, when I was a company commander, one of my one of my platoon leaders was British from the British Army. He was a an exchange officer. He was awesome. And the other was uh, a woman. And there are not many women in aviation. There are not many women in combat arms, let alone aviation, let alone Apaches. Like she had to bust her ass to get there. She was an, like an Olympic caliber swimmer at West Point. And when she came into the unit, John, like nobody wanted to fly with her. She was this woman. When she left Afghanistan, her, her uh, call sign was trigger. She was in the worst fights, did such a great job from the gunner seat. Like she just kicked ass and nobody gave yeah. a shit. Everybody wanted to fly with her in the end. It was, yeah, fuck. It was really yeah. cool. like nobody gives a shit as long as you're doing your job in combat you right, know like that right. that was pretty cool to see there and then at the i will say at the agency you got a lot of folks from different backgrounds and like ryan from the army is not going to match up with a lot of assets from other places but other people are and it, yeah and ryan isn't going to fit the mold the military guy isn't going to work all the time like you gotta have other people who can slide in and and work an asset to steal secrets it's yeah hard. yeah no i agree i totally agree it's it look this is why I'm a firm believer of everyone starts somewhere, right? If someone comes to one of my classes, like I get it. It's your first time. You suck. Like, let, let's just look, let's just say it like it is. You feel this too. However, let's start the journey to be better. Right. And what happens is along that journey, what happens when you get better? Right. That's when people are like, yo, I'll go with you. I'll, yeah, I'm in. Like, let's go, right? Because you've earned that place, you've earned that respect, right? And and I, and I don't think that's just a pilot thing. I think that's everywhere. And I think that's why. I look, and I know people talk about fucking racism and shit these days, right? I'm a firm believer that racism in America in 2021 is not worse than it was in Chicago, South Chicago in 1970. You can't convince me it's worse, right? But you know, I don't look at any of that. I, I've always looked at performance, you know what I mean? And I've had guys that I didn't like, you know, for whatever reason, do something. I'm like, yo, you just did this. Like I had a, dude, I had a mechanic, one of our mechanics when I was a troop sergeant major in seventh group, right? Like he didn't want to, he didn't want to drive a gun truck. And I'm like, look, you got to come with us. We need, look, what if one of these things breaks on target? We need you there. You know what I mean? Like, I can't tell you how important. And like, he didn't want to leave the wire at all. That was his mindset. And then like one day, like we blew up the front of a vehicle, like his, this vehicle was fucked. And uh, the next morning I came out, he rebuilt it. And I was like, dog, uh, how's that vehicle we blew up last night? He's like, it's, it's ready to roll. I'm like, it's ready to roll. What are you talking about? He's like, I stayed up tonight and I fixed it. And then that's when I realized he doesn't like leaving the wire. I understand it. But this guy's still fucking good. You know it's what okay. I mean? He is fucking like I was something. like from this day forward, me and you, I got you from here out. Like, don't don't let anyone ever fucking raises a word. You you tell them to come to me, right? Um, and I feel like there was so many of those moments throughout my career. It never mattered what your what your fucking skin color was, what your MOS was. None of that mattered to me. What mattered to me is like, I'm here, I have to do this. And I'm trying to do the best I can. Are you with me or not? And if you're with me, like no questions asked, let's go, right? And I feel like that's what people miss. Like, and and I think that's what social media does is it separates that barrier. So you'll always miss it. 
right? And you'll have to identify another way other than till the day that guy dies. He'll if he needs anything. If I seen if I seen that guy and it, the headline was he killed a busload of nuns, I'd be like, them nuns had it coming because I know this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, sorry, I know this guy, right? Like, um, and I think that's what the world misses today. God, do you know what happened to that guy? No, no idea. No, yeah, I'd like to get in touch with him. Yeah, damn. But anyway, yeah, like through my time, there was always guys that like. There's always that one moment that someone does that redeeming quality to you, where you're like, "Look, me and you from ever will be good." Hey, so hey, John, let's jump into that one, if if you will. Like, I'm going to tell a story, and I'm going to ask you to tell one. Okay, all right, you go, you go. So for me, this is like my my worst near death experience. So I'm going to ask you something similar. But okay. so we, we went on a mission with, we were supporting a ground exfil out of a place in, in Afghanistan called the Jal, uh, the Jal Rez Valley. It's in Ghazni province for those who've been there. Every time we went in that place, somebody got shot every single time. It was bad. So we infilled an infantry unit in there. And then a couple, like maybe seven to 10 days later, we exfilled them out. On the exfil, we got hit pretty hard. We knew this was going to be bad. We tried to convince our battalion commander not to go. We had to go. He knew the ground commander, the ground battalion commander. We had to go in. So like this was the worst fight I'd ever been in. I was on a flight with the best pilots I had available, right? So for me, it was a, a dude I interviewed. The second interview I ever did, a guy named JT Snow. Like if you were ever on the ground and saw an Apache and you were like, I wonder what the dude inside that cockpit looks like. It's this guy, like this badass pilot, the best pilot you can imagine. Right. Aviators, aviators. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like he he's a badass to me. Like this is the pinnacle of what you want to be. And then in, so it was the two of us separate ships. And then we both had different co-pilots. One of the co-pilots has been a long time, 160th pilot and just not mentioning his name because of the, the work they do. Mm -hmm. So like we had the dream team going in all day long operation. We go in with Chinooks. We're exfilling people by air. We're recovering a convoy coming out by ground. Convoy gets hit. We never saw it. Like we come in low to draw fire away from the guys on the ground. We get shot up. It's just a shit show for hours. And we're flying like well beyond our, our mandated uh, flight duty time. Like we have to get approvals from colonels and then a general to stay in the fight. We come back, like we, we had to refuel on the way back to our, we're based out of coast. We're flying several hours to get to the fight. We have to refuel in flight back to coast. When we refuel, I'm commanding all the all the shit. I'm in the front seat, which is where all the guns are. My co-pilot, this dude, Sean Breath, who's a badass, he's like, hey, hop out. Make sure we don't have any bullet holes. I get out. We're refueling. I don't see any problems. I hop back in the aircraft. I'm like, we're good. We fly back to our home base. We shut down. We get out. Oil is fucking pouring out of the aircraft. <laughs> Bullet holes are everywhere, but because the aircraft was running when we were being refueled, none of this came out. Like we watched this RPG fly out and John, I'm curious if you've seen this, like it was like, we talked about it afterwards. It was like slow motion. Like we could see there, this. RPGs are so slow. Slow moving. Yeah, we could see yeah. it, the burst, like the, the warhead, yeah. so close. It didn't air burst for whatever reason. Most of them don't go off. That's yeah. what say that that saved that saved more Americans than anything. They just Dude, didn't go right. off. So John, I'm sure like this is this is like oh that was Tuesday for me for you. Yeah. For us, this was this was a big deal for me. Like we came back. This was the closest I came to death, in my opinion. Like all the shit I had seen was solidified. Then I didn't talk to anybody, but I just went back to my room. I should have dealt with it differently. I didn't. Like what was the what was that like for you when you went through something like that? I'll tell you this: as soon as, as leadership, as soon as guys walk away from something like that, as leadership, you need to go to everybody and you need to tell them, "You did your job. You did a good job today. I appreciate you, right, and everything you did today." And you need to go around and tell everyone that because I did that, and I felt like prior to that, no one ever did that to me, and I felt like started to create my burnout where when I was, well, you know, I was an asshole all the time. It's true, but I was burned out like by the fucking, you know, six, seventh rotation. I think mean, I was burned out. Right. Um, so I would say in a situation like that, whether you're the boss, whether you mean it or not, you go to everybody and you like, look, you did your job. Cause like guys for me that would shoot guys, I'd be like, Hey, great shots. You did your job. 
good job. And if that's the first thing you heard, you'd have less likely be pondering over it later. And that would be my my recommendation in that situation is make sure, look, this is fucked up, you know, like, you know, the succeeding in the Delta Force is humanity at its worst. You know what I mean? Having said that, if if you could just give a, a guy those kind words, he would be better off long term. He wouldn't be stewing over it in his room trying to figure out like fucking shit he could have done that doesn't wouldn't have made a fuck anyway. Right. And then everyone's going to do that, by the way. And, and you're not just talking about conventional army, John. You're talking like I'm everybody. talking everybody. Like you got to do that shit. Still. Everybody, everybody. Look, I tell you, this is I believe special operations in general has no way to deal with and or could they deal with operational burnout? How, how like what what would you do to address something like that, John? Like, is there even a way to do it? Yeah, yeah. I fucking I'd make you work for a year or so. And then I tell you, go home, come back when I fucking call you. Go get a hobby, go put together an old car, go fucking hike Denali, go, I don't know, find what makes you, you, and try to forget about this as best as possible and come back later when your head's in a better place. Because it's all, the brain is what powers everything we do and it's all cyclical. And there's going to be times you're not in a good place. And there's going to be times you are in a good place. How about come back when you're in a good place, right? And then I can prolong instead of you only being able to do fucking eight years, 20 years, whatever the fuck it is, maybe you could do 50. Imagine the experience you would have if you were still in at 50, yeah. you know, like, so, uh, you know, I, I think the military does really well at indoctrinating 18 year olds into being men. Or women, or whatever they end up being—I don't know, fucking unicorns. Who the fucking knows these days? But if I, I don't know. like, I don't—I don't want to leave. Whatever you want to be, John. Whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't want to exclude anybody. You know, I don't want to be like the misogynist. This is I everybody. Said, We're wrapping everyone up in this. Boom, boom. Big arms. Prona- pronouns. I don't even know about. Bring it in. Bring it in for the big win, right? Like, bring it in. That's right. But uh, yeah, man. Like, whatever you are, go away and come back when you're more valuable to me. And that value takes time. You know, look, I say this all the time. Wisdom is knowing better. And that's fucking great. But you don't know what you don't know. And an experience is fucking everything up. And like me, I fucked everything up a few times. Like, and then knowing, like, hey, look, I've already, I've already been down. Like, trust me, you don't want to do this. Like, I've been down this road. It don't go well. So if you just listen to me, we just move forward from here instead of, you know, uh, so experiences fucking it up and realizing how to do it right. And, you know, a lot of what I do is, you know, look, you should be making mistakes. Mistake teach you what works, what doesn't. You've got to make mistakes. Fail quick, fail often, but the military doesn't like that. No. How? Hey, let me ask you this, John, because you, I mean, you lived it and now you teach it, right? So this like fail quick. Yeah. I mean, I'm in corporate America. They don't want to yeah. see failures either. I mean, the military is bad about it, but yeah. Corporate America just wants success. Like how do you mentally wrap your head around like dealing with yeah. failure? Well, okay. So define failure, right? And as we start to define failure, we would know um, what would be acceptable failure and what is not right. acceptable failure. I was, I was literally going to say acceptable yeah. failure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, okay. Uh, captures our cowie. Did we capture our cowie? Yes. Okay. So was this mission success? Yes. Right. But there could have been a lot of little fucked up shit in the fucking 1,200 buildings we had to raid and the 1,800 cars we had to gun down to get to that motherfucker. There could have been some major failures in there, however, overall was success. So again, we have to define failure and figure out what failure could be. Now, as an individual level, right? If, if people worked for me and I knew what their failure, what a failure for them was as their boss, I could be like, yo, you're fucking this up right pick it up we got deadlines to meet we got whatever so it does apply to the corporate world it's just you'd have to figure out those terms our terms are always the easiest terms did we live yes oh that was success in my book right like uh, (laughs) in in business right the success line is uh a little more somewhere else than like the obvious we all live let's fucking we're good um, so you just need to find where that line is and you got to be able to willing to define all that stuff to yourself okay so let me ask you this so you were a pilot, you were a company commander, you did combat, right? That You did eight years in the army. That's fucking respectable in my book, totally, right? Um, 
what made you want to go to the farm? <laughs> so I left, I left the military like a lot of officers and tried a private sector job. So I went and, I went and sold medical equipment and it pays well. The people who do it are doing good work. They really are. They're helping people. But man, I just missed the mission. I missed it. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. I think a lot of people listening will know. That trying to be part of something bigger. Yep. Bigger than yourself. Something to believe in. Something to, something to drink coffee over in the morning. Something to toast to at night, right? Like, yep. Yeah, and I feel that. I, I was miserable. But, and I'll just be honest. And I know a lot of guys listening to this will feel the same way. Like, this is not what I wanted. I thought there was more to this. And I went hard back into, like, how can I get back into the mission but not the military side of it. Like right. I want to deploy the way we did. Like, what can we do? that's different. My dad grew up in the state department. Like I watched that and the CIA looked good. And I applied several times. It's hard to get into that place. Um, eventually it worked. It, it's a long, long process to get in as it should be. I'm sure it's the same way with the unit. Like a lot of tests, they're checking for things you never thought they'd check for. They're breaking you down in ways you didn't think you could be broken down. The psychological mind games are hard, um, but it, it was back overseas, like living in these different cultures, meeting different people, super inter- like people like you that are from different countries, John, you know, like yeah. that have lived yeah. these really interesting lives, have run up against interesting people, have had really tough, like legit challenges in their lives. Right. It was cool. Yeah. So yeah. It, it was a great experience getting into that. That was what drove me like this. How do I find that camaraderie, the mission, that again? Yeah. As a, as a solo guy, I worked a lot with your guys only because I can go out solo and pick out people in one of my 60 vehicles. You guys had to go in three black suburbans with bodyguards and fucking that's how people end up dead. So I ended up doing a lot of work for a lot of guys like you. Uh, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Right. And you seem pretty, I'm going to ask you this because I know this is what guys are, would ask me and I'd be remiss at asking. What's the largest amount of cash you carried on you at any one time? It, look, it's not high, but it was super uncomfortable. Uh, I had a on me. People have carried much more. Yeah. But where yeah. where I had to get that through was hard. And it ain't easy to carry that kind of cash. Volume-wise, that's not a small volume of no, money either. It's not. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I'd say that weigh about a pound also. That'd be about a pound of cash, in my opinion. <laughs> if you go by weight. I will say like in different places, that might not be a significant number, yeah, but yeah. depending on what kind of borders you're crossing, that can be hard. Yeah. I read uh, wait, a guy wrote a book. He's an agency guy. He wrote a book about how he deployed to Afghanistan and he went to Kandahar and they found the roof rigged with explosives. Have you read this book? You know this guy? I, I've not. So in the book, He's he lands at Kandahar and like some you know Delta Force guys are supposed to pick him up. Well, it was me. I was fucking late. And why am I late? I'm one motherfucker running a war here. You know what I mean? I got a ton of shit to do. Picking up you motherfuckers at the airport is just something I'll do because I stay busy. But it's not my fucking job. So the guy in the book writes that I'm fucking late. And when I read that I was oh, fucking shit. late in this in this meeting, I'm like, yo, motherfucker, the battle of Kandahar just ended. You think motherfuckers are to the minute gonna come pick your ass up? Like, yo, this world is fluid you know what i mean it could take me a couple more minutes to get to you just be cool bitch be cool right like uh so anyway <laughs> i read this book and i read this and the guy had a lot of interesting things to say but what i didn't know is i don't know how much money like he brought a duffel bag and it had like three or nine million dollars in it right what he didn't know is that toyota truck i was in had we could put a million dollars in an MRE. We could fit up to three million in an MRE box. And I'd usually carry about three of those in my little Toyota truck. And like, if shit happened, we have fucking paid people, right? Like, so uh, I was curious, like, what's your biggest payout, right? Because I'll tell you this, it's like that payout is also depending on your responsibility, right? Like they're trusting you with fucking, I seen guys trusted with huge amounts of cash. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what it's all about. I mean, what you just described is going into Afghanistan. Imagine crossing a first world border with a shitload of money wrapped up like you're a drug dealer. Like, how do you explain that? It's not easy. You know, like, a uh, small- yo, I'll get through that shit. That shit, fucking chump change, motherfucker. Shit. Like, I got you. I got you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, fuck, I got this. 
it's hard, but I will say there were guys that I, that I was at the agency with who were like, you know, when we're having a beer, the kind of way you have right. described John right. with right. the buddies, yeah, yeah. like yeah. When, it, when it's just you guys and they're like, this is when I was doing the shit that I thought I signed up for. Not all right. the, right. the 99% of the boring crap that you never see in the movies, but when you know- Typing that, cables, oh, yeah, bro. Typing cables. Type, you know it, the cables. Like, you know it. When you're doing the stuff that you see in the movies, like, there are a couple moments where you got a briefcase full of cash or a duffel yeah. bag full of cash and you're like, you're in this weird city you've never been in. Like, you know you're doing God's work here, right? I love like, that. And love I'm sure that. you've been in it too, John. Like that for yeah. us, we've talked about that for sure. Yeah, for sure. I love that. I love that in every way. I loved all those situations, man. I love turning sources. I mean, I turned fucking Saddam's into a, into a source. He gave up the Oh, fuck yeah, dude. I got a Saddam sweater in my closet. I had all that motherfucker's clothes at Wait, one time. Wait, time out, John. What does a Saddam sweater look like? It's like, a, you want me to go put it on? Like literally, if you got and, it, yes, please. All right, do. all right, don't move. All right, count I'm gonna to pour fucking a ten. All yeah, right, don't yeah. move. What's no up? way, no way. I'm a, I'm no, a fat I'm guy on. in a little coat because Saddam wasn't so big. You know what I mean? Like look at this motherfucker, like Tommy boy remember? right here. Woo! Look, it's got no, it's got out. no like glitter on it. Look at that, man. Come on. My belly, like my belly hangs out a little bit. I wear this on Christmas Eve. Shit. I got like a million questions I want to ask, and I know I can't until we're offline. So anyway, <laughs> no, ask them now. Like, I, no, hey, man, people want to know. People, this is why we do the podcast, dude. Like, all right, I mean, you had to turn somebody who's close to a madman. How did you do that? I turned everybody who touched his body, made his food, put clothes on his body. I turned every one of those motherfuckers. How? Like, what is the? What, like, how? Like, I mean, that's like mafia style, right? Like, how do you get somebody hey, to turn on the I'm, on the dawn? Hey, I'm just a fucking cab driver in Baghdad. It's Bullshit. part of my story. Dog. Bullshit. Hey, I'll tell you this. I think I'm going to get this back. I think I'm ready to support this item. I have the... You ever see the video where Saddam shoots the Mauser? Yes. Right? He's in I've a trench it. coat. He's got the fox fur hat. Yo, I got that hat. I feel I feel like it's got to be in a frame. Like you're an NFL... Like Well, that's funny you say that because... I gave it to the South Texas History Museum and they put it in a glass case, but I'm about to pull it from them so I could just like pimp it in the fucking target on a Tuesday. You know, what dude, I mean? you might have to pimp it and then it's got to be in like DC and the National History or like the American History Museum. Shit. Hey, here's what I got to say about the American History Museum Army retirement sucks. Fuck you, pay me. <laughs> just throwing it out there. Like, hey, you want this fucker? I'll give it to you. And I'll tell you the backstory. Matter of fact, me and you should talk about the backstory because it's a great story. What's the backstory? Like I tell you this, the initial search for Saddam, the raids and hits, the shit we did in the beginning of the war is what fucking caught Saddam is fucking mind blowing. Like people wouldn't, wouldn't expect it kind of mind blowing. No, fuck no. Yeah. Yeah. Right. People think, look, look, all the shit you see on Instagram, guys wear fucking BDUs and they fucking raid places with night vision. We did a, we did a ton of fucking clever shit. That's how shit gets done. You got to be smarter than the bad guy. When, look, the first time I went out alone in Afghanistan, here's what it taught my entire fucking squadron. We have to be smarter if we're going to be on top of these motherfuckers coming in helicopters, guns ablazing. You ain't catching no one like that. What? How do we actually get to these motherfuckers? So, and that requires some fucking outside of the box shit. And what used to kill me is like, this is another thing that kills me. And I know you heard this and it drives me crazy. And for years I've bit my tongue about it, but you know, oh, guys used to tell me all the time, you're an out of the box thinker. Oh, you're out of the box. You're out of the box. Motherfucker, I have never, no human being on this planet can actually be out of a box. The military is creating a box for you. The agency is creating a box for you. You're in a fucking box. But what you need to be able to do is outmaneuver someone else in the same amount of space. So this is John, when you're going to win. John, I might, I might push back on you a little bit. I feel like the boxes are there. Like conventional army is a box like this. SF is like this. The unit might be like this agency somewhere around there, but there are people like you and dudes I knew who are somewhere on a different plane who are pushing things in a different way. That's outside what everybody else considers the box. You know, I would say you'll never be out of the box. And if I could outmaneuver anyone I came up against in the same amount of space, you'll never win against me. Let's talk about the farm a little bit. Like how, how actually was that? I got to be honest. When I retired, I did so much with guys just like you 
um, that I didn't want to go that route. So, and that's just me personally, like, it's not a lifestyle I wanted to fucking live. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm not saying that as it's a slight against you. I'm not saying it as a slight against me. I'm just saying it's not a fit for me. Right. So, um, let's talk about the farm and like, you know, what was, what was really good about it? All right. So w- without getting into any details that I can't disclose, I will say like, yeah, no, the, no, no, cla- no, I don't want to, no, no, I know. I, and John, I know you're good with this. Like the class that I went, went through with the number of people that were in it, like you're segmented into different groups. The group that I was segmented into, we had somebody who was a former special ops type who self-selected out. And I, like, I, I'm not going to go into details because of exactly what they did, but they were like, this isn't for me. They were a little bit older. I was, I was younger as I went through. They were a little bit older. They had retired from the military and went through this. And they're like, I'm not doing this bullshit. It's just, it's games. But John, I'm telling you, if you knew where this person came from, you would never believe that they would self-select out of anything in this world, like nothing. And I'm not saying it's because it was hard. I think it's, it, it wasn't physically or mentally challenging to that degree where you'd self-select out. It's more like, I'm not going to play these games, but it's a shitload of mind games psychologically it's difficult to to overcome and i've talked to guys like yourself and tom satterley and these other dale comstock who have done the the selection into delta and the guy the few who have made it it's not like that the selection is different it's long it's it's like it's psychological there's no physical aspect to it well it has to be because most of the people in there are right out of college it's it's not like half of them are right it's not like you're picking out of the best and brightest the army has to offer Right. So if you already knew the guy was the best and brightest, why would we do this to him? Right. So I, I think it's a matter of, I, well, I think what you're talking about now is a necessity for them uh, uh, to, to groom people for the future, which yep. I'd also say this is there was a time when I was 20 years old where like playing those games or the mind games, I may not have noticed like I'm in the grind. I do my thing. Like, fuck, I do my best. And as an older guy, it's like, and this is why I've never applied is like, do I really want to do that? You, you coming from Delta probably wouldn't want to do that. You probably wouldn't. But I will say, like, the young folks in there, not all of them make it through. They don't have yeah. the professional maturity to get through. Like, the training's one thing, but it's it's probably like the unit. Like, once you get out there, it's these guys got to go up against people who are a different age, different demographic, culturally different, and they have to be able to operate with them. And if you don't have the professional maturity to do it, you're going to get crushed and you're going to yeah. hurt. Them. So they weed those people out. And I will say far more than the conventional military I went through, probably not like what you went through, John, but like the conventional side I went through, the selection process was brutal at the agency. Like yeah. there's no, like you want to cry and, and be concerned. Like your dad was so, ins- no, you, if you don't make the cut, you do not make the cut. And they don't make cuts like slowly along the way. like. When I went through flight school, a dude self-selected out at hovering, somebody self-selected out at the bag, but for the most part, everybody made it through. In this, it's not the same. At the agency, like they're yeah. going to cut your ass if they don't think you're going to be able to hold your own by yourself. Right. When no one's looking, if you can do the right thing well, they're going to cut you. And there's no, like, if you, if you cry foul, no, you're gone for sure. And it's probably more like the unit than it is conventional military, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've always been the mindset is, uh, I was so embedded with you guys. You guys didn't know I wasn't one of you guys at one point. And, uh, this is me and a few guys, you know, I wasn't just the only one, but there was a few of us where you guys had a problem. You came to me because I was able to shit helicopters and and airplanes right now. And no one questioned, you know, how this is possible. Um, and then I got to the point where when I retired, I was like, I don't think I want to do that. I don't think I want to help the people that we traditionally help sometimes. I don't think I want to. And I, I just felt like it's not a path for me. I got yeah. a ton of guys that are on that path. And I'm going to tell you, there's a ton of retired Delta Force R majors over there. Uh, still fucking working to this day. Guys that work with me, probably whiter than me. And, uh, and they love it. They love every minute of it. You know what I mean? Okay. So you make it through. You make it through your class. And then you're you're on your own to run. What happens then? Shit. All right, John. So I'm going to throw a question at you. I'm going to throw. Uh, I'm going to explain something as best as I can. But I want to throw something at you that 
many people from our first conversation have brought up. Like, how could you let John get out of that conversation without talking about exactly what happened on the objective when he was solo pulling a dude out of a house, right? So I'm going to come back to that if you can explain it. But I am going to say it from my side before I come to you. Like you go out to the field, working at headquarters is different. When you're in the U.S., it's, it's, it's just a different yeah. story. When you're out right. in the field, right. it's, another, it's another story. You're out on your own. You're rolling yep. around for a couple hours, making sure nobody's following you. You're meeting somebody who, if they see you meeting with this American guy, they're going to die. Yeah. Right? Dead, you got to yeah. make sure nobody's following you. It's right. hard to do. Then right. you get to the meeting. Maybe you got 10 minutes. Maybe you got an hour and a half. What questions are you asking of this person? that are of greatest importance to the U S right? Like for national yeah, security. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, to me, that was w- when I felt like this is where I'm supposed to be. And John, I, I might ask you this, like I've met a few people in my life who I, when I talk to them, I'm like you are doing or have done what you were supposed to do in your life. And in those moments, I felt like this is where I'm supposed to be talking right. to this person. Nobody knows I'm here. Nobody knows this person's here. We're getting secrets. It's going to help us out in the long run, might save American lives. Right. I'd ask you the same thing. Like, what was it like for you when you felt like you were doing what you were supposed to be doing on this earth? And was that at the unit? Was it somewhere else? Since I'm wearing the sweater, which is an Italian sweater, by the way, it looks good on me. Flattering. Flattering it's a the word. it's a fat guy in a little coat. I'm telling you, if I back up, it's like it's like a large, and I'm like a double triple X. You know, like, hey, my gut, I got a muffin top. I got a muffin top down here. Muffin you know what top. I mean? Like, look, Not, look at the collar. Like, you can't even kids, see my neck. Like, kids like, don't, I don't even have a neck. Like, kids don't get the muffin top. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll keep this in context of sources, and that is, I never thought I'd be running sources. I never thought I'd be turning sources. I never thought I would be doing intel preparation for us to do raids at a later date. Um, but the problem is, is there's just not in those, in some locations, there's just not the human to get going. So we got to get this going, right? Um, having said that, um, I never seen that the driving there in a taxi, right? The, the, the times where, you know, whatever happens, guys try to do it on their own. The source ends up dead later, right? They bring in us like, Hey, our sources are ending up dead. Uh, can you help us with pickups, with conversations? Um, I never felt like that would, that's what I was here to do. You know what I mean? It was just something I got to do to get to what I'm supposed to do. It's a, if this is a five-step process, well, this is step one, right? And then I got to get to step two. I got to, you know, whoever's going to do it, I don't give a fuck, but shit needs to happen. So I never seen that for me. Uh, however, like when it was fucking chaos and there's gunfire going everywhere and it's fucking, I got to tell somebody something to save the fucking world as we know it around us. Like, Yo, foreign policy by John Trek McPhee for the United States. Like, whoa, this is money. I'll do this right now. Like, I love this. Like, so in those chaotic situations, I'd love like fucking this is what we're doing, you know? Um, However, I never felt like those situations were what I was meant to do. I always felt like that was just something that needed to be done along the way of what, whatever I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I I, I will say this, John, like, as I look back at, you know, I was an officer in the military. I was an officer at CIA. Like everybody's, everybody's an officer there. I, I was asked to do stuff at the agency that I, had ne- I would have had to wait 20 years in the military before somebody allowed me to do that. Whether they thought right. I was good enough right. to do it or not, at the agency, right. they look at you and they're like, you can do this. Execute. Yeah. And, and there yeah. was no other question asked. And you just knew it from the person. The way you're describing, like, you went out on your own. Sounds like nobody else did that before. John, like this guy's got it. Go ahead and do it. You know, like yeah. there's more. Uh, I saw that at, at the agency a lot. Everything I'm about to say is on the internet, so I'm not throwing any fucking secrets out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The first time I drove on to the agency compound in Virginia, right? Like, yeah, the farm. John, I yeah, love that place. Well, no, like Langley, the, the place where all oh, the shit. Oh yeah, happens. yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody who's listening, who's been in the military, you've been on an army base when it when like PT's going on, you can't go faster than ten miles an hour, or you get pulled over, like. I was driving like that. Like I was this military officer from before. I'm super scared. First time on the, on the base, like what the hell am I going to see? They have a, they have the A12 ox cart. Like you guys should look it up. We'll put, we'll post it on here so you can see it. 
It is the successor to the U-2 spy plane. It is the precursor to the SR-71, which is this, yeah. the Blackbird badass yeah. aircraft. It's sitting in the parking lot. So as you're driving around, like finding a parking spot, you you see the A-12 ox cart. It's awesome. They got, they, John, they have components of the the D-Day landing, like the... Um, yeah, they're called tank traps. Yeah, that, that were on the beaches from yeah. D-Day, like pulled yeah. from Normandy. Yeah. They got them on yeah. the compound. And you guys' museum is through the roof. The oh, farm it's, museum. It's sick. The farm museum is like one of the coolest places I've it's been, sick. by the way. Yeah. It's sick. Yeah. But but like you drive on, you see like there's this spy plane. Here's the the mines they used to stop us from hitting on D-Day. The bur- a portion of the Berlin Wall, like you can't walk into that place and not think like, I'm being, a, I'm about to become a part of American history and it's pretty cool. Dude. So I would say like, it's your original question many minutes ago, like about the farm, like that is why yeah. I joined that organization. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this. Why'd you leave? Shit. This is a long story. I'm going to shorten it very, look, if you could take me right now and drop me into the middle of Africa doing that work, I would do it hundred percent. Completely agree. But I have, I have a 13 year old son who's been to uh, 10 schools, right? Like zero stability. I have a wife who makes more money than me and has had zero stability. So we looked for a way to find meaningful work for both of us and moving every two years to different countries is not that. So we moved out to Silicon Valley. I work for a big tech, com- tech company. You can find it on LinkedIn. Um, this right now is good for our family, but John, like there are times where, and I know, I know a lot of vets feel the same way like god damn i wish i was in delta in the unit or i wish i had spent time in flight concepts or the seal teams or whatever it is to have paid my my time forward i would tell anyone this you can't regret what you didn't do if you try everything you want to do I'll drink to that. That was actually hey, good. John, I said, I'll drink to I that too. I talk shit all day long. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. That <laughs> was amazing. Like, the it? only question is, name one thing, one small thing that you really liked about combat. Like, it could be anything. You could have used a certain rubber band in the cockpit that helped you read the maps better. Like, what was the one little thing that you liked about all of it where it's like, yo, this is money. Like, I love this piece, right? Like, tell me that. Shit, this is tough because this is like a question I ask everybody about what they carried with them in combat. Yeah, but it's yeah. not quite it that for me. Like, yeah. Well, what shit. was your favorite? I'll tell you. I, like, I've had some my, good answers. Yeah, my, hey, my favorite piece was always the chaos. Like when no one knows what the fuck is going on. Yo, I win here. I will win this situation because chaos is my fucking jam. Like I thrive on this. I've trained for this, and I'm gonna win this every time. Right. So for me, it's chaos. Like. What is your thing you actually liked about combat? Like, like you know, you liked every part about it. I carried shit with me when I was in combat, like a picture of my family, my wife at the time, like when she was little. Um, but I will say, like, there, there was something about the worst combat I was in, John, and I don't even know what it was like for you. And, and I would love to hear this. But, like, for us, some of the missions we were on when it was the worst, like, I'm not going to make it out of this. And I just mentally prepared myself for that, how I was going to come out of this, if I was going to make it at all. This idea of like, hey, this is okay. The way I'm about to die is all right. It's it's okay for me to die this way because other people are going to be all right because of it. There was something about that that was both useful for me, like that drove me, but also hurt me later on from a psychological perspective, right? Like I never really dealt with that, I would say. I know, why did it hurt you? Delta why did it hurt? probably dealt with that every fucking night. Yeah. Why did it hurt you? For me, like at the time, I, I would love to ask you this, John. Like this was my near death experience. I got off the aircraft, all the oils running out of the aircraft, right? Like I jumped down, my co-pilot drops down. We're there. We hug it out. Like we can't believe we're alive. To me, this is, I shouldn't be here right now. I should have died. This RPG should have airburst. The bullet holes we found in the fuselage, like in the fuel cell should have killed us, but we're still alive. In the movies, when somebody lives through a near-death experience, their life is great. I don't feel that way. You know, like I go back to my room, I don't say shit. I cry to myself in my room, right? Like that's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to like live through this near-death experience and feel like every day is a gift. 
but it's not like it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. And, and like you were in Delta, you probably saw more near death experiences than anyone. How did you handle? It? Well, I tell you, it boils down to someone initially going, "Fucking keep doing that," right? Like I had a guy, a guy was fucking around. I was a troop sergeant major. He would this. We we're trying to gain entry into another building next to our target target building. Um, door keeps opening and closing. I'm trying to get the people out. So I get a banger. I'm by the door and I'm going to launch it up. And it's like a square compound where they got the square in the middle. Right. And I'm trying to get it in there to wake these motherfuckers up. So as I'm fucking around by the door, as the boss, a guy opens the door, closes the door, opens the door, closes the door, opens the door, closes the door, and then opens the door and it holds. And one of my guys fucking shoot him through the crack of the door, like crack of the door. And, and it shot a guy behind my back in special forces in the special forces. Uh, what's it called? Sephardic. They teach never do a shoot behind. What, sorry, John, what's a, a Sephardic? Is that what you just said? Yeah. It's like, it's like the special forces target. I don't fucking know. Interdiction. I don't know. It's, it's the assaulter school for okay. the special forces, right? Like the unit has OTC special forces has Sephardic. Make sense? Yep. So um, Sephardic says never do a shoot behind, which is shooting behind another teammate. But if that guy hadn't done a shoot behind, I might be dead. Holy shit. Really? So the number one rule that motherfuckers argue about is the rule that saved my fucking life because a dude shot under my armpit and killed a motherfucker who had an AK. So uh, so um, let me back up. Let me not get emotional here. But um, so according to special forces, you can't do a shoot behind, right? Which is into your own forces, but he did a shoot behind and it was successful and it saved my life. Right. Um, <clears throat> with this, right. What, what you'll have to realize is what is right or wrong in the moment. Right. And then the, they tried to fuck that guy later. Right. And I stood up for him. I'm like, look, this motherfucker saved my life. End of fucking discussion. Like, I will never fucking say anything against him to this day. And to this day, I won't. Uh, because he, I believe I'm here because he fucking shot a guy behind me. Which breaks every fucking, every rule of CQB you have. But the problem is, is like, why the fuck are we making rules on ourselves? Because if we didn't put any fucking rules on ourselves, we couldn't break any fucking rules. We'd all be good, right? Like, so um, I think that guy did the shoot behind and saved my life. And I think that is one of those little things right in combat that I enjoyed because every fucking fool, everything the army tells you every fucking thing for every time I told you, this is fucking great. There's a time where we probably shouldn't fucking do that. Yeah. And it just reinforces in life the never say never. So, so John, the same dude, JT snow, who I was flying with on this crazy ass mission, like we were flying into the target and we, as co-pilots, like between aircraft, we were like, Hey, we're going to go put ourselves between us and the ground force. We're going to draw fire away. Is everybody okay? Like you might get killed. And it was, he initiated this discussion. He was a CW4. He never made CW5, which is like the Sergeant Major equivalent in, in the warrant officer community. But I will tell you this, John, and I, it's probably true for you as well. Like there isn't a single fucking person who flew with that guy who wouldn't go get a beer with him now. Right. And it doesn't fucking right. matter that he was a CW4 or CW5. You know, like doesn't matter. that dude kept them alive when it mattered. And that's what's important. So like there's there's a monetary aspect, obviously, for retirement. But who wants to go get a beer with you later is important, too. And this dude, like anybody who flew with this guy will say the same shit I'm saying right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, like it's the it's always the little things that like you know, it's the we talked about this earlier earlier in the podcast. Right. Is it's the little things that might stick with you. Someone could say something and it could be this fucking big, like that fucking big. And like that sticks with you as your mantra, right? Like, so it's always the little things that stick with you. That's why I wanted to ask, like, you know, my favorite little thing about combat, the littlest thing was the chaos, first and foremost. If I had to say there was another thing besides that, I would say I liked I like the fact that everyone had a job to do and everyone did their job and everyone counted on each other and everybody pulled the rope together. And that's how we succeeded together. The mechanics needed to get the yep. vehicles to drive, you know, the, 
the pilots needed the crew chiefs and the fucking supply guys needed to get us all ammo and fucking we needed power we need air conditioning so we can get fucking sleep before we even got here right like look you know you, i'm for sure what I'm talking about is a fucking bigger machine and being thankful for every one of those guys right and always treating those guys like you know look you know, we had mechanics go on targets. Why? Because if the vehicle gets fucked up, I mean, who better to fix it than bring the fucking mechanic? Well, you know, it doesn't take much to drive an armored vehicle. You fucking drive, right? But just those little things could be the difference later in people's lives. I mean, if we could fix a vehicle and get the fuck out of here, we're less likely to die. Why wouldn't we want that, right? So I think it's always those little things that like always for me made the big difference. Um, and that's why I wanted to, to ask and ask it special as its own question. It's favorite thing they liked about combat. I'll tell you what I liked in a bigger sense. I liked the regimen of it. I'd wake up, I'd, I'd do an hour of cardio. I'd go work out for an hour and then I'd eat dinner. After dinner, we'd plan and we'd go hit between one and 400 buildings tonight. Like pick your number, you know what I mean? Like pick a number. Um, and I, I love the grind of it and I love the security of it. And I love the fact that, you know, my squadron, maybe more than others, maybe less than others. I don't know. Um, I love the fact that we were always super aggressive for um, our aggression, our hitting a number of targets, our killing more people than normal, us capturing more people, us doing more targets than normal, all led to us being better at everything. Not just better, but we learned how to win every one of these situations. John, what was it about your squadron that led to that? Was it the leadership? Was it like, what the hell was it? Look, uh, I just talked to a buddy of mine today. I, what started the unblinking eye was Zarqawi was starting to pop up. We're still looking for Saddam. So we started planning ISR assets to overhead, right? To follow these guys. And then it got to the point where we had, we scheduled so many assets so much, so far in advance that we scheduled shifts and all the leadership had to do a one or two hour shift. And during your shift, you watch the vehicles, you watch all the ISR feeds and you wrote notes of what you've seen. Like, Hey, you know, uh, all the assets from building, you know, this building, that building, this building drove to this building and dropped off fucking stuff, dropped off something. Sorry, right? John, Delta guys were making those notes. Dude, I was making those fucking notes. And that's what started the unblinking eye. And when we started telling you guys and the fucking Preds and the fucking ISR assets, we need more and we need to watch more. Everyone thought we were fucking crazy. Until now, we live in the unblinking eye world. A standard business when it started as us, I mean, me taking fucking paper notes in a fucking talk. You know, it's like my my duty tonight is sit in a talk from three to four a.m. and write down anything that happens in between. And we're following this vehicle there, and like it started the unblinking eye when when you when you look at these things holistically, what you realize is they started with the smallest of ten, yeah. intent, and it ends up being this That's institutional. True. Yeah. And it ends up being this in institutional knowledge that now everybody does. Who is like the dude you serve with who you're like, I would never fuck with that guy. He would crush me. And, and you don't have to name the name, but if you could describe who they were, because I know it, it could be sensitive yeah. where you lived. I got to be honest. I don't know too many guys that could outmaneuver me in the same space. So I would say this, if there's a guy out there that could best me, right? holistically for his life uh i don't know who he is how about that guy that you told me about who used to pt your ass off um oh, what are you talking about oh the the rasp guy yeah you described a dude yeah. who like yeah. pre-unit yeah. and then in yeah. the unit who was yeah. like hey y'all yeah. we're going for a yeah. run yeah get ready yeah i think through clever planning and deception i'd shoot him in the fucking face <laughs> Oh, I may not win in the straight up gunfight against them, but I could ambush that motherfucker and get him done with. So I, I would say this is like, look, um, you know, and, and, and this is what I don't I don't get in general, like in the gun industry. Right. I'm in the gun industry because I teach missile classes. Right? So um, in the gun industry, like you got pro shooters like, you know, you want a gunfight against me? Oh, yeah, I'll take you on. No, not only will I take you on, but I'm going to leave you dead on your doorstep. 
right? Just to fucking send a message that you probably shouldn't have fucking dabbled in an area that you shouldn't have begun. Uh, but the truth about it is, I'm not going to stand with you toe to toe. I'm going to catch you when you don't fucking least expect it. You know what I mean? So, but that's the premise of winning. The winning isn't a head to head pound for pound world. Winning who's better prepared, who's, we might weigh the same. If we weighed the same, it'd be who's better prepared, who punches better, who, right? So my point to all of it is, if you want to best me, you better surprise the fuck out of me. And you're going to surprise me. You're fucking doing something. You know what I mean? Shit. So, all right. So John, like, I think maybe there's around three for us one day, but I do Let's think do it. I'm in, dude. I think we could do, look, I gotta be honest. This is the best conversations I've probably ever had on a podcast. And yeah, I appreciate for you for that. And I would tell you this, we could probably do this a dozen times and people could learn different shit out of every one of them. For real, I'm telling you, like the stuff you're talking about could be applied to corporate America, right? It, like, is, it should be. You don't need it to show be. up like tit for tat. Like you can show up with the, da- with the deck stacked for you against your adversary. Why wouldn't we play to all of our strengths right now? That's the best way to win. Right. I Why think would I play so, your game? I, I think would... about this a lot in corporate America. Like, I shouldn't show up to this event, the meeting, the engagement without like a better deck stacked in my favor, right? Like, correct. And you hear it all, I hear it a lot from SEALs, but you're articulating it now from the Delta side, what you can bring to bear that gives you the advantage. It's not a decision advantage, physical advantage, but it could be decision as well. I would say this of... Of all the new guys I've ever got, and I got I got new guys in Baghdad, and I would tell my new guys, when I got a new guy in Baghdad, I would tell him, he just got out of training, I'd be like, look, the next two days, I want you an arm's length from me at all times, right? You're the new guy. You need to be with the most experienced guy at all times, right? That way, the mid-level guys only got to worry about them. They don't got to worry about you. I'll worry about you, right? And after about two days, the new guy would be somewhere else. And, I, and I'd ask my fucking apes because I had some fucking big guys on my team. I'm like, yo, where the fuck's the new guy? And my apes would be like, I don't fucking know, boss. Like, fuck that guy. He ain't here. Like, fuck him, you know? And I'd go find him and I'd be like, why are you here right now? And, it, and the new guy would, every time this happened in combat the same way. If I would have stayed with you, I would have impeded flow. I would have hampered the gunfight. It was easier for me to go. And every, every time a guy told me that, I'm like, hey, check this out, motherfucker. I want you to stay with the team as much as possible. But from now on, you're fucking on your own. Um, and what I, what I would say about that is there's a certain amount of institutional knowledge you need to understand before you start trying to fix the fucking problem. Yep. Maybe we need to do it around three sooner or later. You answered every one of my questions that I had for you. And I went through, look, check this out. I did my homework. I listened to our interview and I wrote down similar questions that I would ask you, even though we might've walked 80 miles to get to your answer because it's a back and forth. I still kept on task. Right. So um, look, I hope this turns out for a good origin story for you. And I think there's even more that we need to hear from you. Your fans need to hear from you to know more about you. You know what I mean? Like John, we didn't we didn't even talk about the porn stash. I tried to get one a week ago <laughs> in Hawaii based on our discussion. I went to the stash because I incidentally cut the porn stash in half and went so, to the whole stash. I <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to admit to this and do not tell my wife this and I hope she doesn't see this part. But I found the porn stash pictures and I almost sent them to you today and I was like Come on John, like, send me the shit. And it was like, it was like the pre-interview picture. And I was like, I was like, oh, I'll wait till later until I talk to you. Maybe I'll share it. Maybe you could throw it in the thumbnails or something. Maybe one day. Okay. Awesome, man. Well, hey, uh, dude, thanks. I think we should do this again. I think we should plan on a third time. And I think the third time should be just fucking freestyle. Like we should just talk about fucking veteran shit. And I, and I got to be honest, I think everything I've told you today applies to the corporate world. It's it just does. you. It does, what, you, what you would have to do is figure out the definitions of success, failure, um, I don't know, achieving, not achieving. You'd have to figure out the definitions for the corporate world to, to do a good, you know, I don't know, cause and effect type model that would help uh, corporate people. But everything I said today applies to the corporate world in one way or another. And I apply everything I say in my own business on a daily basis. 
especially in my employees. Like, let's look at what we did. Let's be honest. Could we have done this better? If the answer is yes, what could we have done better? And why don't we do that next time? Like a lot of simple conversations, like that is simple questions that, you know, people fall in love with what they do and they're not asking. I, I think that's the next talk for you and I, John, like how does what you learned at the unit apply to day-to-day private sector America? Dude, you know, I'm, I'm really, turning a new page and I'm fucking writing that shit down. Oh, bring God, it. It's so good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, man. let's do that. Let's do that. And then look, I'm going to share one more thing with you. So I told you, if you made a reference while you were talking about pilot school, I would drink a frozen bottle of screwball. Where is this at here? Right. I would drink a four. Like, so this is what I showed while you weren't looking. Any Top oh, Gun shit. references. Like, God. if you would have talked about Goose or an inverted whatever, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, John, can I, can I share a story about Top Gun? Yes. Matter of fact, I'll even drink this. Share. All right. Yeah. Anybody who is still listening, who is that dedicated. They're with us. They're with us, dog. This is good shit. They're with us. Listen. Love you guys. Every time we went out for gunnery in an Apache, we had a Top Gun competition. It was called Top Gun. All right. Like, this is the guy that I was. You might laugh when I say this. We went out for a flight. We were crushing this gunnery cycle. It was at night. We were killing it. We got lined up on a target. We shot it. It was the wrong target. It was not our fault. It was not our fault. Everything we do in the Apache is recorded. The dude in the backseat, this CW3 at the time, I think he retired as CW4. Really good dude, Craig. He paused the tape and he, so nobody else is listening. And he goes, Hey man, we can erase what just happened in the last 15 seconds and we can go and win Top Gun and we can be the Top Gun team for what happens. Do you want to do that? And I said, nope. We're going to have what what played out. Play, play, it, out. Like it, play it like it happens. Play it, play it like it lies. Yep. And we did. We came in second. I was a junior second lieutenant. This dude was a junior CW3. We kicked ass in, in the event. We, didn't, we did not win it. Somebody else won it. I, to this day, I don't know who won it. But I will say, like, personally, I'm glad we didn't fuck with the tape at that time. We could have easily said, like, yeah, we didn't do that. Here's our shot. And we record the one that looks best for us, but we didn't. So I don't know like what that means about us. Maybe we did not come to the fight in. Look, Adv- I'm going I'm to tell you this. If you give me a test in anything, I'm going to be at the 70%, the CD level. I'm going to test at the 70% level. If you put me in a real situation where you need this fucking done and I'm the person that's going to do it, I will achieve it 100% of the time. Yeah. How does that work? Exactly. It look, I, I would say this, and, and we should close out on this, right? And, and let's close out on this. I would say this is the unit in training will always give you scenarios that can't be solved. There's no answer. I don't think anyone could solve this. Matter of fact, I set it up. I know you can't solve it. And <laughs> and when you run unit guys through it, they'll always figure it out. How does that work? Right. And what I'm telling you is there's guys out there that don't test well that put in real situations will always achieve. And there's guys out there that test well when put in those same situations won't achieve shit. So the somehow you need to look for the the scrappers, the guys that will survive where they look and they'll fucking, they'll come through this just fine. You know what I mean? And I think this is a skill. I contribute this to a skill of what I would call is you can, you could answer those questions that could never be answered. You solve the problems that could never be solved. And the, this is the, like the, so what, and when, when a guy is good at the, so what doesn't matter what you throw at him, they'll be fine. All right. Let's end on that. John, this is a great interview, man. Hey, I love talking hey. to you. I could talk to you for hours, man. Awesome. Hey, we need to do this again. Let's schedule it again. Hey, for the guys that have watched this far, like, The goal was to have your origin story. I think the reality is, is this became so much more. And I think this is, uh, this is kind of this, uh, tit for tat, right? Like, you know, you, you've seen certain things. What did I see? And, and it, it became more than what I thought it would be when I was writing down my, my top 10, I think it's 10, like look, literally like you can laugh, but look, I wrote out all my questions on a page to make sure that I asked you fairly all the same stuff you did me. It was super fun. Thank you. Cheers. Hey, thanks for everything, man. And uh, 
let's close this out. This is this is the end of the Sheriff of Baghdad podcast. This is also the end of combat stories and the origin story of, of combat stories itself. So, hey guys, cheers. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. People often write to me with incredible stories and suggestions for interviews. If you want to share a combat story of your own or from someone you served with, record yourself for up to five minutes and email it to ryan at combatstory.com. I'll select some of these stories and feature them at the end of our episodes. Thanks for listening. Stay safe.